and really what we need to do is to be having great sex mm-hmm. that's what we need to be doing but this we're not so, <laughs> so we're going elsewhere you know we're looking elsewhere like people will have a classic thing is guys tend to have a particular interest in a particular area oh, on like, let, let's right. be honest every man has a go to right it. exactly what's yours so um, yeah, I wanna, I'm, I'm being quiet now because I do want to know. Um, big bums, right? Particularly. Okay, big so bums you've got that type. kind of thing, and <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so you didn't have to grab it. No, but so in sex, but, yeah. like doggy position is something that for you is that's what it is. I mean, wow, you've nailed it. You've nailed it. But it's there, isn't it's it? It's like you're in his mind. <laughs> yeah. and, and she's so, sort of reading me right now. <laughs> but what else is something cool on top where you can hold it as good right, as well. exactly. But often guys <laughs> won't say that. Yeah. Oh, girls won't say it. I mean, I'm You're saying it. I'm liber- putting it all out on the line. Really, this has been a very revealing week on the Church Audio YouTube <laughs> to channel. To some extent, it is good. To some though. extent. To some extent, it is good, though, that you can just say and, should and feel say comfortable. It. Yeah. Yeah. And that it's say not. It more. And that's- I love big bums! There you go. I'm <laughs> saying it! We actually did a podcast called. Um, Britain's darkest taboos at one point so this is sort of funny uh, because we we were laughing about some of the subjects on the show because we were like how is that a taboo we saw you know what I mean yeah our joke was yeah well we can explain this we can explain it on the podcast because I think I thought we were already are we we on he's doing a sound check right okay cool I can't believe that you had the series Britain's darkest taboos before I was even in it that's amazing. We stole right. it. Think ahead. Think Basically ahead. stole it. It right. is a silly title. And that, yeah. It's a silly title. It's not, again, we were saying on this podcast, it's not a taboo to murder and rape your mum. That's not a taboo. That's a crime. You know what I mean? That's not... <laughs> a in, taboo in, in, is in, sort yeah. of, yeah. A taboo is like, oh, you just parted in the lift. That's a taboo. <laughs> <laughs> Murdering your mother's not a taboo. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's a strong taboo. It's oh. a dark taboo. It's as taboo as you can that, That's the thing. Get. You've got one that. It is yeah, a dark it taboo. Is. Yeah, it is. It is definitely a little bit taboo. You ever played Taboo, the board game? No! no. It's a great game. You should play it. Um, I'm learning something new all the time. Yeah. What is taboo? But it's oh. like um, you can't say five By the way, words. ladies and gentlemen, uh, yeah. Emma Kenny, thanks for coming. <laughs> thanks for coming on. We didn't do that. Me. We're not Russell. We haven't sort of done it as professional as he did. Yeah. He sort Russell of, does it. He set it up. He's like, Emma Kenny, psychologist, you know, got her on therapy and all yeah, yeah, we little, done he that. does this lovely preamble where he sort of yeah. goes, Emma Kenny, oh, absolutely love you. You're brilliant, aren't you? And he yeah. sort of sits opposite you with the mic and he's like, oh, yeah. And the thing is with you, right, is you're like, wow. <laughs> and then you just go, yeah, great. Thanks for asking. Thanks for coming. Yeah. So thanks for coming. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. I'm um, really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. You're mm. the third lady we've had on the podcast. Oh, oh that's brilliant. Yeah. So that's, Doing it for the girls. Yeah, yeah, one of the special select few do you know what I mean? It's mainly yeah. a large show, as you know. I think it's mainly so. been populated by guys because that's where the interest has been on the channel. Mm. Yeah. But the more women that we interact with, the more we find you're actually all right. Yeah, we are <laughs> actually just all right. Yeah, yeah. That you'll find that a lot of women are more laddish than any man that you'll meet. That's if we're yeah. going to look at gender stereotypes and the way that we attribute those characteristics, uh-huh. definitely. She's already into And me. also, women talk a lot more about really interesting material and things that guys would probably be quite... Shocked no, uh, especially with each other though. That's like what men, I mean. when we're, when men are sitting alone together, yeah. I think we talk about like football and stuff like. That. Women will go into the goriest of details. Oh, we want to know absolutely we, everything. I, me and him have never. I've never asked him about what sex is like with his girlfriend. Once. Oh, you have to. Never, never. No, you don't. You have to. Do you then. know what I mean? What? Yeah, ask her. So yeah. I'm a bit more of a sh- I'm a bit more of a sharer than he is. So. I think that sharing is so important. Mm-hmm. Genuinely, I literally am one of those people where there is no subject that I won't talk about. Mm-hmm. I'm really happy to talk about everything. I like think I have a no shame filter. Yeah, where yeah. I literally, I just don't care. Do you not think though that's that's like part of your job and your status? Like you've sort of Possibly. earned that right to be that way. Do you know what I think it is? If I'm really really honest, I think that when you look at yourself as a person, you have options in your life to why they live in the way that I feel I live which is with this degree of acceptance that I'm imperfect I make mistakes my views aren't always correct but that actually that's me and it's not that I won't learn or relearn or recalibrate some of my ideas it's just that for the most part I just think we're all human like we're all animals walking around in jackets and stuff if that isn't crazy enough. <laughs> so, some are less uh, sort of hidden animals than others. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, we, we are kind of all acting these roles. And there's something about normalizing just how crazy it is to be here and be in this room and talk about these things. Yeah. So why not have everything on the but, table? But the self-acceptance thing is the hardest thing to get to for sure. most, especially the people watching this show who are sure. like young people. Because everyone's all on this like journey of, and one day I'm going to be that perfect person. Yes. We never get there. So true. And eventually, I think some, if you're lucky, you just accept like actually 
it's all right just to just be who I am. Yeah, it really is surprising to me that I was kind of looking at social media the other day because obviously a lot of my job involves working with people around things like body image and I was interested to see that Snapchat and Instagram are like the two major players for young people and I just started to think about what that meant and it's like actually if you think about those they're just image, mm. they're not really about conversation, they're about my story, I'm taking a picture covering my mouth or... It's such you know, bullshit this. actually. Yeah. Instagram's the biggest... <clears throat> I like Instagram and it's fun if you do it in the right way but when you look at other people's like I'm sitting there thinking you're just not living that life yeah, at all exactly. especially some because uh, I know what YouTubers roughly are yeah. making and some YouTubers who are acting like ballers are actually living on pot noodles and it's like what, but just put out what you're really living exactly. like I'll have so much more respect exactly. for you exactly and the other thing that you were saying just then about young people is that they've got that kind of manifestation of who am I what am I doing what do I need to be where am I going and we all asked all those questions when we were young of course we did but what I can't get my head around is why adults don't just tell them so I've got two lads and my two sons are my little masterpieces mm. genuinely I, I look at them and I think I've no idea how I've done it yeah. because they are miles better than I deserve and I mean that wholeheartedly mm -hmm. my mum used to say to me I wish I knew a child exactly the same as you and that was not in a positive respect you know right. she just wanted me to have the hell I gave her wow. my children are mind-blowingly brilliant and they're not perfect of course but I have from day one told them the truth I've told them that the kids that are in the popular group even if you're in the popular group they're all worried about whether they're in the popular group right. and more worried that maybe they won't be in the popular group even if they are in the popular group and the kids who are the most popular are thinking am I popular and nobody ever feels like they actually belong at that point yeah. they're all worrying and actually the thing is that we need to do is we need to kind of get people to start seeing what you were just mm -hmm. talking about that authentic actually no one knows what they're doing their entire life we just survive it in the best way possible undertake to do it joyfully learn stuff on the way but never consider yourself an expert and when people use the word expert for me there's always that bit in my brain that's like yeah right you know how could I possibly be an expert on people people are just so dynamic you know put me in a different culture I haven't a clue I don't know what it's like to be living in, uh, in a city in Africa and what the cultural standards are there. I'm not an expert with people. I have honed my skills with certain individuals in Western society. But to some degree, until we have those conversations with kids, they're always going to be doing what you're saying, watching these kind of things and trying to look for the little synergies of hope that tell them they're okay just being who they are. I think it shows a little bit as well that we, um, we were saying this before we started that must annoy you that we, uh, he always starts the podcast before the podcast it, that when stuff I can't like, have a piss before a podcast because he just starts right I in I just go straight in when, when stuff is like uh, naturalised or is sort of everyone accepts it as like an unspoken truth yeah I think that's quite a difficult thing to breach and that's changing all the time and I think certain people have really learned to exploit that like certain politicians learn to exploit that unspoken truth side that no one will ever challenge certain social norms and those sorts tell of me things. a little bit more about that though um are you doing the It's really interesting. Thing? No, um, I'm just really interested in that point. I think it's like, what well, we were saying, it's like a bubble, isn't it? You sort of live in that bubble. You don't necessarily realise until you leave that, that there is that, that uh, the way that things are aren't necessarily fixed in the way that you feel they are. And they can feel quite fixed in that moment. A lot of people, I think, could just feel quite trapped by that. Especially you find it in school, I think, because that's such a bubble. Yeah. That you are... It feels like there's that social hierarchy and structure. Yeah. Even on YouTube, there's that structure. Like yeah. Logan Paul, or oh. Jake Paul, those guys, they're the jock guys. You've got the geeky guys. You've got all these. It's funny because you came out with one word, which was worry. Twat. Yeah. <laughs> twat. I came out that, with the word twat. You came out with, about with him. worry when you were describing what kids go through. And I was editing a video last night, and the world's strongest man was on this show, and he yeah. said his a lot of his. Uh, depression and, and where all of his energy comes from is the worry he had as a child of, of, of and even an alpha alpha male was worrying about am I fucking my life up yeah. you know when my parents die what's gonna yeah. like all of these worries that we all have yeah. um, and I think that that is like the source of where it all stems from is when we're young yeah when we're children I think that we're born into a world where everybody around us seems to know more because we're children. Mm -hmm. But often, because we're unaware of how to communicate our needs, because again, we're children, and we're learning all these new experiences going to school, because remember, that's one of the big things for me in Western society. And everybody's got their own perspective on this, but personally, I look at children preschool, and this is not to do down the education system, like teachers work really hard in the UK, but I think the system's broken. so. 
I would take a child who was maybe four years old before school and you can test them in lots of ways but usually they're quite divergent so they're good at thinking critically they're good at thinking about how to do things physically they're mm-hmm. creative and imaginary in that way but then you get them to like eight years old and what's happened is the system has taught them the biggest myth of life which is that you're either a success or a failure. Mm. That these parameters that they measure, so are you good at maths, English, science? Well, that has no bearing at all on intelligence. Mm -hmm. That will not make you a successful human being or an unsuccessful one. What will is your belief in that myth. So instead of accumulating young people's skills by noticing what makes them individual and unique, we tether them to these ideas of what intelligence is. Imagine being a kid. So from my experience of working and having the privilege of working with very socioeconomically deprived young people and running projects for those, and your neck of the woods, you'll know exactly mm-hmm. what I mean. Mm-hmm. When you're working with them, you, you're trying to unravel all this language they've been taught, you know, that they couldn't read, they couldn't write, and they couldn't indeed, but they had been neglected. They'd been born into the excuse me, wrong families, you know, with the wrong parents who weren't very nice to them. They'd had poor diets, very little education. they have been brought into crime, all of these things. And it begins with, uh, you are this and I am that, a separation. You are clever, you are a failure. Mm-hmm. You'll succeed, you'll fail. And the unraveling of mm-hmm. that is something that takes literally a lifetime to yeah. get over for those individuals. You know, you go into prisons, you know, nobody's talking about the fact that probably 70% of the men in prison have been sexually abused because we don't want to tell that story, do yeah. we? We don't want you to feel sorry for people who are in prison. But actually, yeah. you know, that's really where society it's, has gone wrong. It's funny you should say that because when I was um, 10 years old, my mum was told by my teacher I was destined for prison. And at 10, she'd written us off completely. It's like, horrendous. I mean, he's a total <clears throat> write off. And like to see what I've got and to achieve, I think it's fair to say she was wrong. A uh, prison in for now, anyway. I mean, you know, if yeah. I meet Logan Paul, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, we'll but, all um, be in prison if that happens. But in all seriousness, like uh, kids are getting written off massively, especially the further north you go. They do. Mm-hmm. They well, do. I think a lot of, that happens a lot in London as well. Yeah. I think really? It, yeah. yeah, because I think a lot of people think London's like everything's paved with gold. Mm. If you go, the weird thing is, especially in London, neighbourhoods next door to incredibly affluent neighbourhoods. Like if you go to Greenwich, you can then go down to Blackheath or other areas like that, and it's not there's not nearly the money, but mm-hmm. the no. kids are all just as intelligent. Although yeah. I think it's, it's also the teaching that all those things are inherent, or like that you're born with those things. Yeah. I think that must be really frustrating. That's really frustrating as a an adult when you look back and you think you're told those things. If that sticks, yeah, and that you can't change that. I think that's what yeah. frustrates me when people they paint traits as if you yeah. can't change that trait and to some extent that whole leopard learn. can't change his spots but yeah, of course they can <laughs> or, or they just learn how to treat their spots yeah right? that's he right spots but he just it's and it's how you treat success and failure yeah that's a good metaphor yeah. is is not um is is less about um you know if you're a failure then that's bad if you're a success then that's good your failures can also be good and your success can also be bad because it can go down different well, routes. Like you, of course, because you learning. win or you learn. I, I watched a really good story yes, yeah. show yeah. last night about um, Greek myths, about myths from all over the world. And there was something about, and we studied this in our degree, about common narratives around the world and how you can pretty much pick out a common narrative from east, west, yeah. everywhere, especially the hero narrative of like, you start oh, yeah. off at home, you leave home, you have a challenge or you have something you need to overcome, you learn and then you face your final thing. And I think that can be quite damaging because everyone feels like they have to go through that to get to the, what they see as the end of the Yeah, what you were saying at the beginning about young people kind of watching this and worrying where are they going, what are they doing, that's probably one of the things that every human being could do to learn to stop thinking and feeling because it's this idea that there's no time, there's this idea that there is a right way and a wrong way and the reality of life is being content is what matters and some people can be content being brain surgeons, some people can be content staying at home and looking after children, it really doesn't matter as long as you've got that contentment and when you look at happiness, money does make a difference because it makes it more simple you know and you can't say to somebody without any money oh it won't make you happy what we can say 
is if you've got a decent like standard of living and by that I mean you can eat, you're warm, you're safe. The stresses are removed. Then even if you've not got loads of cash, your happiness level mm-hmm. will be the same as somebody who's a lottery winner mm-hmm. because you can't alter that. That's about your attitude. What changes and what manifests itself is when you start accepting that actually as a human being, you're good enough. It doesn't mean that you can't learn to change and transition and grow, but that it has to begin with that idea that I'm okay. You know, fundamentally, I'm okay. You know, my history hasn't defined me, my future hasn't happened, but there's something about me that I know inherently is okay. From there, I know exactly change. what you mean because I feel like we were having a chat about this recently, and he said, "Were you were you ever at a point in school where you were like, oh, I'm really happy with who I am right now?" And I went, "Mate," I said last six months the first time I felt that mm. and I'm like I was 29 do you know what I mean so it's such a buzzing it's, feeling it's that though isn't it but, but what you're describing I'm literally like yeah, yeah completely feel but it's taken me most well 99% of my life to get to that point I had, I had a really interesting um experience once with uh, like a therapist yeah um, you do a lot of like one on ones I do I still do quite a lot Mm. of work yeah it was quite interesting um, I I went to have CBT for like a sort of low level depression problem no not for depression it was for um, just like like uh, a number of different like little things that built up towards it like anxieties that kind of thing but um when they broke it down to me, it seemed really, really simple. It was just like, well, you just break that thought process and you'll just stop doing those things. And it was really interesting to hear someone just say that because very rarely do people say, well, if you just stop that thought process that you go down, you'll just stop acting that way. And it was really, and I got it. Like, what, I literally away. walked out and <clears throat> it was like... Ah, oh, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, but I felt a little bit like, well, I've done you, you know, I, I need to come back because I feel like, <laughs> you know, I, I owe you more <laughs> sessions. Or that, like, you know, you fixed me for 60 so, quid. So like, what, uh, just off the back of that... You know, when people come through your doors and that, yeah. is, there, is there a most common reason why people come to see you out of all of the reasons? Would you um, say? In my traditional work, which isn't private, mm-hmm. then people would come with very high level trauma because my area is working primarily with young people, for example, who've been quite heavily sexually exploited right. or sexually abused, but on the private level where people come to me, most of the adults will come because they're searching for something. Right. It's a sense of not knowing what's wrong all the time, but feeling that something isn't quite right. Like a need to motivate change, but without knowing precursor to that what needs to change. Right. So usually reactionary, feeling like, you know, my marriage has ended or I've got an eating is, is disorder. Is that midlife crisis type of thing? Well, I mean, I mean, I always like to think of them as midlife <coughs> awakenings I just think like midlife's an epiphany oh, it is because everything changes you know you spend your life as a young person and this is something I try to teach my boys all the time because my lads are kids who obviously like gaming they like going online they like watching videos like this that's what they enjoy doing because that's part of their childhood that's culturally become the norm but I try to enforce in them that understanding that like childhood's like bleating you don't on a reflection basis, a nostalgia basis, think, well, I'm going to look back when I'm 40 and go, wow, I really enjoyed all those hours sat on my PlayStation. It just (laughs) won't happen. You'll think the memories that we made on holiday or the memories that you played when you were making dens. So I'm trying to teach them that. But bringing back to your point, I suppose that one of the things that we do is we walk towards life for a long time. It's firsts, you know, from having sex for the first time, going to a party for the first time, having your baby for the first time, you know, all these firsts. You get to midlife. And it's the reconciliation that this is coming to a close, that our firsts are over and our new endings are beginning. We're losing our parents, we're losing our friends, you know, those kind of things. For most people, or me anyway, it was all about one day I'm going to be this person. Like, And and you build everything up. And when I hit 30, which I recently did, I was like, when I'm 30, I'm going to be this guy. And I am... Not so when I was 14 and I had this vision of what I was going to be when I was 30, I am absolutely nothing like that person, <laughs> and I'm glad to say I'm way better. Yes, but, but but I had me as this like clean cut, like perfect life, nothing bad's ever going to happen to me. My life's been an absolute car wreck, <laughs> but because I've dealt with it and come out the other side, I've been lucky. <clears throat> But I think so many people get to that point of 30 or 40 or whatever age they've got built up in their head, and then they're like oh shit, I'm here now, I'm supposed to be this person that I've built up and I'm not that person. Yeah, that's the Western myth. Uh The Western myth is there's a blueprint. You know, you've got a blueprint and it goes, 
you go to school, you go to college, maybe you go to university if you're lucky, you meet somebody, you get a job, get have married, a plan. You blah, have blah, a plan. blah, blah, blah. And then by your plan, you've planned so much, mm-hmm. you've got your pension and you're dead. You know, or if you're like me, you haven't got a pension because I'm just going to freestyle it. I don't even care. I'm just like, forget it. Who cares about the pension? I might be dead. Mm-hmm. But that is so damaging because it suggests there's a linearity to life, you know, mm-hmm. an ABC. And what you just described is what so many people who are successful it's describe. It's been put to me by my granda. You know, you get a pension, you got to get a good, you've got it. to trade. If you're not going to trade, you're going to be a yeah. waster. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And exactly I'm like, it. I've literally made it up as I've went along, the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. But I think that's a, it's dangerous to advise people to do that in a way because... But you're your product. Yeah. I think there's something brilliant about being imparting to people the advice that they are their best selling feature. You mm. know, if you can hone your skills and whenever people come and say to me, and I have it all the time, and it kind of creates this like grief in me because I can see exactly what needs to change, but it takes a lot of courage. So if I ask somebody, what do you want to do or be? They'll often either shrink a little bit and tell me. So somebody said to me yesterday, and it took her ages, she was a reporter, we were just doing an interview, and I just said to her, you know, what's your long-term plan? She's interning at the moment, and she went, really read and she went well I'd really like to be like the host of question time and I said what is it about <laughs> that feeling that you've got that makes you feel like it's embarrassing to say it uh-huh. I said, it's question time well <laughs> that. no but, but it know, does that, feel like a pipe dream that's saying right. that out loud it's because it, right. you know if I say for example like oh, when I was when a I kid the Champions League with Manchester United so one of our friends once said he wanted he wanted to be manager of Manchester United and win the Champions League. That's, I think. That's uh, I'll let you guess who that may be if you watch the kickoff. Adam. <laughs> and um, I burst out laughing, but, but when you have pipe dreams like that, people do think they are ridiculous. Yeah. But sometimes they happen. To be fair, exactly. The other thing is you can't have success without vision, and those dreams that you have are there for purpose. So when young people, and I used to work with a lot of young people who were quite damaged, you know, and they've been quite broken down by society, and I'd ask them what they wanted to be, and just getting them to even have a vision was was enough, you know. But realistically, if you actually say to yourself, "This is what I want." and then work towards it just step by step by step. The likelihood is you will get where you want to be. You will get to achieve that vision. Okay, you might not be prime minister if that's your vision, but you'll probably end up you know, in a ministerial position or working for local parliament. You, you can get that journey going, but it comes at you realizing that it's you who makes a difference. Look, agency is a big part of success. Agency says you happen to life, life doesn't happen to you. I remember when I was younger feeling like everything was reactionary for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I reacted, you know, I made really stupid decisions and reacted to those stupid decisions and at some point along the way I was like this just doesn't work one it's broken because I'm following somebody else's blueprint that by the way hasn't worked for a long time that's why society is as it is right now that's why we've got such a massive class divide that's why we've got kids on the streets and poverty and homelessness that's why they're going to be clearing the streets for the royal wedding because homeless people you know let's get rid of those they're bringing society down you know this awful awful situation in society that we've created because actually we're all living lives in a capitalist context where we buy more to spend more to carry on buying more so that we can keep spending more so that we can earn more to pay for a bigger house and a bigger car and we know it has absolutely no bearing on happiness and what it does it desensitizes ourselves to all the people there who really need help and stops us being the compassionate humans that we need to be and I have said this before and I'll say it again and I don't care how stupid it sounds I always say that I want to do as little harm in my life and people are like what do you mean you know you're gonna go around and beat people up so you just try to prevent yourself from doing it it's not that I know every day I do that all the time (laughs) literally every day is a struggle (laughs) not to act honestly everyone who looks at me cockeyed I just want to crack them but I love it but yeah so it's you know it's that whole thing about knowing your impact you know when I do my therapy it's all about kind of minimizing the impact that my life in this planet has on the world Mm -hmm. how do I make it a better experience so that I don't harm because humans harm all the time you know we walk past people in the street because we just think they're begging and they're going to go and live in their you know house (laughs) before before outside and we want to see that because then that excuses us from action and that's probably for me the hardest thing these days about living in this western world because It's a world where it's so easy to ignore need and to almost make the people who have those needs seem different or dehumanised or not willing really to to see the great gratitude within it, you know, to actually say that they're not they don't really they don't really need it because they're just gonna spend it on alcohol, that's that kind part, of stuff. That's part of individualization in society. Yeah, in of course. Way though, isn't it? So because it's quite um 
like it's weird we don't look at the system and sort of go the system's messed broken. up like let's 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 change it's that broken. we you they look at the homeless people That's and they so need to just sweep the homeless That's people exactly away it. for a little while and we don't need to worry about exactly. that it's a problem it's um there's something quite problematic about that but people don't seem to address that which is quite unusual yeah. and I, well, I guess that is also though partly down to the power structure once you've got the power you don't really want to step away from that and if mm, you, if the it, megalomania of power but I guess it's also if that system got you into power so say you are Theresa May or whoever and it's not me having to go at her it could be a Labour government it would be different if it was a Labour government it would be massively different if but it was a Labour government mental health would be better but yeah. it, in the first place um if, if if that system's got her to there, then to some extent she wants to keep it that way. Of course. There, there was a story I heard recently from a guy. Um, it was on Unfiltered on Joe, which yeah. is a really great podcast. Yeah. And it was about a guy who went to Russia and um, a sin- and basically invested when the Berlin Wall fell and made a fuck ton of money. Like billions, yeah. Lost all that money and then made a lot of money from... Um, basically revealing the people who defrauded the country of money then almost lost all that money again because Putin turns, turned against him yeah. and now he's had a law passed in the States and in Canada that the people who illegally got that money can't get into the States they'll have all their assets frozen and they're taken away he's trying to get that law passed in the UK but the Conservatives won't pass no, it no. because, no, no, because no, no, yeah. so many of the Conservative Party are funded by Russian billionaires yeah. or oligarchs yeah exactly and, and so they can't they literally can't do that because it would cut the funding off to the conservative party yeah that's a fucked system that is like, a really over- you know it, it's that thing isn't it now that the whole of this system is that this they're not actually politicians anymore they're administrators aren't they right. they're administrators for things like the Rothschilds and yeah. you know they're there to serve a purpose to make rich people richer and the irony is that when people start talking about people who want to have a, be- a better government you constantly get this ridiculous rhetoric that for example Corbyn Corbyn the rhetoric around Corbyn it's just this like liberal fool who's going to go and give all these poor people money and none of them are ever going to work again like it's so defunct it's mm. such a ridiculous idea the idea of creating environments for people where they can feed the kids and they can actually have a life where they don't feel you know like society's let them down and so they can start to build that sense of privilege mm-hmm. and attainment and actually when you see it in places like in Scandinavia neighbor there's places where um, they're giving a universal kind of credit to people it's about 600 pounds a month it doesn't matter who you are or how much you earn you get it and instead of this in the Tory world where they think well that's it then there'll be whole communities of people refusing to work with that 600 pounds you know it's not working that way what's happening is those people are getting 600 pounds and they're going god if I work as well I'm going to have, you know, £1,500 a month. And that means my kids are going to be able to go on holiday. And then the people who are wealthy and are giving it, they have nothing to complain about because they're getting it as well. Mm. So this idea of giving money to people who need it, somehow disabling them and confirming that they remain in that situation, it's not true. Mm. But that's the way we're taught. Mm -hmm. I hear constantly, and I mean, I try not to go on Facebook because, I don't know, there's such a divide now in people's political views. Yeah, But constantly, there are people posting these things about, you know, how dare people who have less want more. And there was this stupid thing, this is going to be really stupid for me to say this actually on your podcast, but it honestly, it kind of made sense to me at the time. It was called the Freddo Continuum. Have you seen it? Mm. They're like Freddos in like 1980 were like... 5p yeah. mm-hmm. and they're like 30p now so basically for the average person to be able to afford a Freddie they need to be paid £17.50 an hour now people were going mental mm-hmm. how, you can have all the Freddos you want <laughs> yeah how dare you pay somebody £17.50 it was a joke right that's is that right. mine I'm oh, sorry that's mine just to say everybody that is oh. mine no, sorry. I did think I turned it off I obviously sorry, haven't sorry. Um, so that we'll was, just throw you out it's fine. yeah that's it so that that the irony is the anger she turned the phone off yeah of course I did. I've never seen a guest do that before. I thought it was off yeah. but the anger that people have about this person particularly was saying you know cleaners don't deserve that money that only educated people deserve that money right, and right. that view exists it's a weird cleaners are right balling honestly to give them as much as they can get thank you yeah, <laughs> See, I don't like yeah. House. well I was working oh. with somebody who does post trauma with people in hotels because apparently about once a month in every hotel there'll be a suicide yeah really yeah so the cleaners are the first people who find them obviously mm. fuck me I know it totally blew I, my I, mind I, well, I get on the tra- uh, train obviously a lot coming up and down the country and oh, I know. Uh, the drivers um, obviously people deliberately jump in front of the train and the drivers basically feel like 
they feel terrible feel because obviously they're in, in the, at the wheel at the time but when someone does that there's nothing you can do because it's too late at that second and they have to take like weeks off and have uh, oh it's horrendous I think after two they just retire you don't they because it happens yeah. and so they just don't let you do it again but suicide in general you I get that when I'm in London quite a lot that you'll know when you're travelling. It's not irregular. Oh, no, throw a person themselves have, in front. have done that, yeah. So it's quite, you know, and the train stop. And there was one a while ago where everything was, was gone and people were so angry. Mm. And you're kind of like, that sense of inconvenience. Somebody has killed themselves and inconvenience me. And that is, you know what we were talking about a minute ago? That is almost that extreme of disassociation not from community. Yeah. You know, oh, this person's dared to kill themselves ruining my day. And you're kind of thinking the ripple effect of that death. And you've no idea what that person was in pain about. You know, people don't kill themselves because they're a bit sad. Uh, on that subject, have you ever dealt with <coughs> someone um, who you've been having meetings with and then they've done yes. that? Yeah. How, how, how was that deal with my, for you? My first experience actually was I was 22, so I wasn't even qualified. Um, I'd started working as a pupil liaison officer back in the good old days where you just got thrown in without CRB checks and mm -hmm. you could just kind of work the with your people. Sort of <laughs> it was a great, a great way to start. But um, I had this client who used to come and see me. She was probably the most serious um, as far as the mental health requirements. But this is a long time ago, you know? And she tried to So you, you think nowadays you wouldn't have been anywhere near her at that age? Um, no, I don't think I would have been. Uh -huh. No, um, and shouldn't have been. I yeah. mean, don't get me wrong, it didn't work badly. I got on very well with her, but there was this real... Is, I've never had it since, if I'm really honest with you. 17 times she tried to kill herself, and this was by the age of 16. So she was somebody who had this intolerable pain of living, mm -hmm. this real, real agony. It wasn't that she had a terrible life, she had All lovely right. parents, but there was just something, I don't know whether it was in her genetics, I don't know whether it was a destruction, mode within her but she just did not want to be uh -huh. here and she threw herself off the motorway bridge um, and I can remember feeling really sad and also really relieved because when you've worked with somebody who is so able to express their sadness and she was one of those individuals who I suppose is quite poetic All right. and very often creative people so you were relieved for her to not be in pain her anymore. parents were relieved as well uh -huh. no we were terribly upset that she'd chosen not to continue but it was also very present that her pain was so, so painful that we hadn't figured out how to soothe it. Um, I don't think our system is very good a lot of the time at soothing. Like I have this vision one day, you know, when I win the Euro Millions, because obviously that's on my mood board. Yeah, it's on the <clears> plan. At least 150 million it's going to need. But I have like this vision, and I've talked about it with my, my kind of colleagues for many years, that people need a safe place to go and heal. But we don't really provide that. And that's, again, not to be disrespectful to the clinical psychologists out there and the psychiatrists out there, because believe me, the NHS is absolutely broken mm -hmm. by the amount of people in mental health crises. And if you imagine being a clinical psychologist, for example, the majority of clients that you'll be seeing and patients you'll be seeing will be at the extreme end of trauma, you know, really, really big trauma. Because in order for you to get for them to get to yes. you it has to be that bad they will be because that they acute will end. be i would imagine well this is the the perception of it is palmed off with drugs for a long time before anyone gets to well, that. part of it is just we just don't have the resources uh -huh. the government have ruined it you know the right. nhs is being absolutely crippled mm -hmm. and because of that practitioners are exhausted as well okay. and they don't take on as many as is required and you don't get early intervention some do in london it's better than where i live where you live it'll be the same as where i oh, live yeah. you know it's not really any good mm -hmm. But even when you do, if you speak to practitioners, practitioners want to make people feel safe and they want to offer compassion, but you know, you've got a limited amount of time and the environment isn't that conducive. You put somebody on a secure ward, it doesn't feel safe, it doesn't feel like home, it doesn't feel like a place of healing. So I've got like this vision that what we really need is a place where people can just go and allow themselves to heal with good nutrition, exercise, safe place to sleep. You know, I think sleeping is really important when you're in mental crisis where drugs are optional but there's also an option to kind of explore you know different treatments that are more I suppose relatable for some people because the medical system is effective it, it really is you know mm -hmm. if you get somebody with really severe depression and they go on antidepressants you know often they will feel lifted to a position where they can start working with you and that can also help them emotionally so it does have impact personally though I think that if you're in mental health crisis in the western world we want to medicalize you and make you be okay in our society because we don't really like dealing with mental illness instead of accepting mental illness yeah. and saying this is part of look this is part of being human 
you said something so pertinent. You said about the fact that that person, the people who like kind of were talking about worried about somebody dying, you know, parents dying, not having, you know, all these things mm-hmm. that are true, they're real, but we kind of sanitize stuff. You know, my best friend died um, in March. Like, she's my best friend since I was seven. Like, we were just best mates. And one of the things that I experienced during that, you know, apart from being with her at home throughout the process of her dying, was at the end, you know, you ring the undertaker and they kind of say, when do you want us to pick him up? You know, after the person's come out to say, yes, that person's dead. And I just didn't want her to go. I didn't want to leave her. I didn't want to take her away. So I made them come and I agreed with her partner that they would come the following afternoon at two o'clock and we were just with her. Mm. But when they came and they put her in the bag and they carried her out, it's like, isn't that just crazy? I think for me, (laughs) I mean, I've been around a dead body before. Yeah. And uh, the attachment to the body. Yes. It's very hard to let go of that. Isn't it? Also, when you're looking at a dead body, you're sort of, it really rocks you to your core a bit of like, I know, like, I'm almost waiting for the eyes to open and yeah. be like, I'm still here. Like, yeah. I, you know, it, yeah. it's, it, accepting that whatever we are, whether you believe in spirit or uh, an energy or just generally we're just going, nothing. Yeah. It really felt to me like a, the spirit had gone or whatever. Oh, I, I totally was like, whatever, whatever that person was is now not there, and, uh, and that is yeah. the shell. Yeah. But I still love that shell. Yeah. I still had cuddles and hugs off that shell, yeah. and, and want that shell yeah. to be okay. And I'm attached to it. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. Oh, I mean that thing that you've just said about and again everybody has their own kind of spiritual beliefs Mm. and like I'm a massive fan of Brian Cox he just laughed me out of the room talking about spirituality Mm. but personally certainly when Pam died you know being with her Mm -hmm. and watching the difference between life and death it's like palpable it's tangible it's not just because they stop breathing it's there's a physical change the body just doesn't look alive in a different form I'm talking not about almost like it's not it's not them but it is them and the way that we kind of cart the body off and I've completely told my family now if I die you know when any of those are around I am staying at home I'm staying at home like you know put some ice on my abdomen I'll be fine mm-hmm. you know don't bloody embalm me thank you very much you're not sucking my brain through my nose I don't want any of that stuff uh-huh. I want to be around people who love me and who I love and spirituality wise yeah the other thing that I think I've experienced since I've had close losses but Pam's like she was like she's my sister you know and, mm-hmm. and you know I, I miss her and I'm pretty pissed off that she died on me actually if I'm honest mm-hmm. I'll be having words but um when when she died I kind of really started to explore love and as a person who kind of is quite you know empirically based and I I like research and I like to kind of have facts presented and I think there's always questions about stuff but you know I'm one of those people I like a bit of logic. No I can tell you seem to come across as someone who um, can can close off when you have to sure. because you have to give people right advice and if you're too emotionally invested you might not give the best advice I can, mm. and also you don't want to take your work home with you every day no. and you're dealing with people exactly. who are really low so there has to be some sort of cut off but when you lose your best friend you yeah. can't cut off no, so I'm, now you're exploring it in a different way totally um, and there's been a few times in my life working as a practitioner that's happened when, when, when I lost her um, what really struck me was love and the fact that I started to think about when people have got ideas of afterlife or not having it, you know, whatever your, your bag is. You know, personally, I believe that there's something amazing about being alive. It's as simple as that. Right. I just find it mind blowing. Um, I don't have to question anything apart from the fact that I feel there's something greater. I don't know what that is. I don't need to define it. I just don't feel afraid of death because I kind of feel that there's a new chapter, whatever that is. Right. I don't think it's going to be this defined idea of head of heaven but I think that there's just something like I said I feel it personally it's just a personal belief but when she died I started to explore like love like why would we love somebody who's dead mm-hmm. it makes no practical sense does it because if you think about death surely as an animal it's far more survival orientated to just dismiss it death right gone ignored forget emotionally connecting yourself to a death would almost seem like a redundant process because it upsets you it makes you sad you know it makes you feel lost and then I started to think but actually what if that whole experience of love I kind of started to see it as like an invisible thread like the grief that I feel like 
the joy of loss is knowing that you've really loved, you know, and you've really, really had that connection. And that that love offers that thread to the connection between here and wherever they are. And I kind of like to imagine that at the end of my life, when I take that last breath, those threads will lead me Mm -hmm. to wherever they are, wherever they are in the universe, whatever that is. And it's really helped me to kind of deal with my grief, you know? I'm very open about my grief and I will miss her forever. Mm. She was amazing. I'm sure you'll miss her My um, philosophy is that when someone who dies who you love, um, I think that the love that you had together is what gets you through that death. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. Because otherwise... yeah. yeah. Because you, you have to come to a point where the sadness calms down a bit and you think... Would, what would they want, you know? Would they want me to uh, hit the self-destruct button in exactly. a, some sort of tribute to how much I love them? No, they'd want you to go off and be exactly. happy eventually. So you have to come to a point of, you all right, you've got to get on with life. And, and the blessing of grief is that it comes because of the relationship that oh, you yeah. had. And you can't have love without loss. It is hand in it's hand. Balance, so isn't it? That's exactly it. The, the yin and the yang. And when I work on murder shows and when I talk to people who are victims of, of these kind of mm-hmm. crimes, you know, individuals who've been horribly abused, you do see kind of two particular extremes, which are the ones who create legacy, as you're talking about, where even the death of a child who's been horribly murdered, they take take that and they take the feeling of loss and they project it into something constructive and consolidate it in a way that moves them forward and means that that child or person they've lost creates legacy so they're always there they're always present with yeah, them I've seen that on the shows way. before where they have like parks dedicated to the kids yeah, and stuff exactly yeah. and then there's the other side uh-huh. which is as you said the, the self-destruct side well yeah I, I did watch one show where um, I think the the mother went on to become an activist and the dad just drank himself to death yeah and Sarah Payne I think it was her it was, I, yeah. uh, the, and the dad uh, he died he a long time beforehand yeah he did um, and that's very common that people will completely well, and, and another thing is when you see in the interviews right after the death when they were outside the court you see in the strength in the mother and you could see the dad was very weak yeah and you could see it didn't take a I bet you there would have been people at that time because obviously I was too young who were watching these interviews sat at home maybe there's an old lady sitting you can see which one of them is going to be holding yeah. the other one up here yeah. how yeah. it's going to go yeah mental resilience is a really interesting thing isn't it because you kind of look at the research on resilience mm. and, and confidence actually and you can actually see to some degree a DNA trace, you know, genetic trace. There's like almost a confident gene. It's just a theory, but they kind of are quite built around that. personality traits Mm, Like a confidence gene. But that does not mean that you can't develop great confidence or resilience. You can learn anything. You can learn it. That's it. Because so for me, I really, really struggle with shyness when I was a kid. I mean, like, I had the worst coping strategy for shyness. I used to put my skirt <laughs> over my head. Yeah, no. Seriously, I used to put my skirt <laughs> over my head. Strategy, yeah. It's the worst strategy. No. What was I thinking as, like, a five-year-old? What I'll do is I'll just cover my head and that'll make everything all right. So there's a girl in the street with her underwear on, you know? <laughs> Bizarre. But that was my coping strategy, like, to hide. And I kind of got to, and I was really sensitive as well, like, people would say something and I'd be, like, ruminating on it for, like, a week. You know, Mm -hmm. even as a very young child, I was very, very hyper-anxious. And I got to high school, and that continued, and I didn't necessarily have a very good experience Am am I right in thinking that... um the way you ended up be becoming a psychologist because yeah. you were in therapy. That's as a, right. Well, as a yeah, I was kid. forced. I yeah. was forced to go. Yeah. So yeah, what happened was I just stopped going to school. Mm-hmm. I just really hated. It. <laughs> I really couldn't stand it. I just couldn't get my head around any of it. You know, I went from being like a quite a small village, mum and dad, you know, very average, you know, working class. And then I went to a private school because I, I want a place like a poor place, and I just couldn't get my head around it you know I heard the word ski I thought that was a yogurt and it turned out it was a sport I heard the word divorce I didn't know what divorce was it was like suddenly the world seemed massive and I got to like 13 and I was so tired of being told that I wasn't as good as the other students and you know all of those kind of messages that yeah in the end I just didn't want to go so my teacher who was brilliant actually one teacher who just was my saviour and she will always be my saviour because she kind of saw something about me that I took with me she's the power of a good teacher is mind blowing and my mum hatched this plan that I'd go to the psychology department I was sent to the psychiatrist and the psychologist and told I was completely sane didn't have any disorders but they wanted to see me because they wanted to see whether they could work on my hyper anxiety and all of those things and I did that for two years learnt nothing 
just learnt nothing apart from how to fill a, a, you know an hour session two years sounds like quite a long time it to was, be in therapy as it well was because really it's, really boring I know it's not really sort of a window on how long you should have therapy for but surely there's like some people have it for like 20 years yeah but I mean and I don't I, I maybe I don't well like spring to. cleaning style thing mm, well people have like deep psychotherapy psychoanalysis for like forever sometimes like lots of hours and hours and hours I, I guess that's one way of coping with it yeah. or if you have the money to be able to do that or you that's can the get thing that somehow because you have you to have the money the no you're definitely um, not but it, that's not necessary i mean my mum's actually a counselor which is not the same as a psychologist no it is but, yeah you um, know I'm, I'm a psychological therapist yeah, so exactly. she'll, she'll be the same as me uh and we've kind of sort of had chats about how you know someone's ready to leave your the exit strategy well. yeah, yeah of course like how that works yeah and sort of whether you give them the, like some people develop their own counselor or sort of their own you give them strategies and all these kind of things two years is quite a long time to sit there and not develop strategies no. so what, what was that down to it was down to the fact that a lot of adults don't know how to speak to young people and right. also you need a young person to trust you so at the end of every session for 15 minutes you tell them what we spoke about There's to your no, mum yeah, no disrespect to how it was. It was probably how it was done in those days. But if you actually asked me, you know, how was I when I started? I don't know how was I at the end. It was a lot worse at the end. Um, and what saved me, what really, really, really saved me was going to uni. I got a place mm. to do women's studies, actually, originally. Went to start it and found Did psychology. Did you say women's studies? Yeah, women's studies. I've got no idea what that is. <laughs> I don't really, I didn't. Well, just come <laughs> didn't take, take, be honest. Are you a woman? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. The giant it was like all of that. It was like about like women's art, history, culture, all of that. You might identify as a woman, but you're not. <laughs> <laughs> it's another but thing. That, whole, that whole kind of thing, I went there and started doing psychology as an elective and then just went mental and took loads of extra courses in it so I could do when it as a fine feel. You had a great time. Yeah. yeah. But, I, but what I loved about it was no one knew me. I was like this, and that's one of the things about Clean reinvention. I love reinvention. I think that. Anybody out there who thinks that their life is this and that's how it's going to be, you can like completely transform yourself by... Especially when you leave the area. I do yeah. think university was a real part. I think I was really waiting to go to London. Yeah. I think a lot of people have that. When they first get to a place, they're <laughs> this like... This guy really wanted to go to London. I just wanted... I didn't want to be in a small town. Anymore. Yeah. Where were you from? Just a small town boy. Burton near Derby. Yeah. In the lonely world. And so, yeah, it wasn't that lonely. Um, Midnight it, train. Yeah. No, it was just... Like a, <laughs> My dad drove me. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, I think, it, yeah, uh, there's like, um, if, it's, if you can free yourself from whatever it yeah. is, you know, all those preconceptions and stuff like that. Yeah. It is healthy. To, to, I think if you stay in the same town your whole life, it, it, it is healthy to just get out for a while and have a year somewhere else or whatever. Yeah. I would agree with you. Although I do also I see... Agree. Even though I love Newcastle. I also think there's a real problem in our society for people who do just want to stay in one place and they're castigated for wanting to stay mm. in one place. I find that really problematic that some people do just want to stay in a town, make a business there, stay there, and that, I think that's fine. Of course it but is. But I think people have a go at those sort of people for not aspiring. That small time to, to mentality. Be the very, to be the very highest that, that, that they're told they can be. Yeah. I think that is quite, that I'd, I'd, I'm just saying like, just a few months or a year, or, or, oh, no, especially I'm not saying when you're, you're younger, saying anything wrong. when you're learning who you are. Yeah. Uh, like for me, I did a lot of traveling in the doing the job I did before YouTube, and then now coming to London, I know I've changed for the better through all those experiences. So. Oh yeah, because the thing about life is that you're constantly looking at people holding mirrors to you, mm -hmm. but sometimes the reflections that they're holding are completely incorrect. Yeah. So particularly if you've grown up in a certain place, the mirrors that have been held towards you may be completely defunct. Mm -hmm. And when you leave and go somewhere else and kind of meet new people in your new circumstances, the reflections are often far better because you've not been held back to completely. the images that you were. Mm -hmm. One of the things about you that really kind of upsets me nowadays is I just feel it's becoming so inaccessible and the truth is that a lot of the young people that I work with you know you'd get maybe one out of 25 kids if I was lucky who go to uni none of them will go now they won't go because debt would scare them and they would not feel it was accessible to them. Why, just, why do you think that debt scares people? Because mm. it's not an instant debt. It's not the same kind of debt. No, it but is it, scary it's though, scary. Isn't it? No and one wants you, debt. No, and if you've grown up in an environment of poverty, the idea of leaving with 60K, when you can't even imagine, your mum might be on 15K at a factory. Yeah. That's a massive, massive risk to take. And also, it says something really loud, I think. It says you're not invited to a lot of people. Because you cannot say in the country that we live in that it is equal in any way, shape, or form mm. for young people. In fact, I was listening to um, Toff, who's just won 
that celebrity get me out of here. I'm sure she's a dead nice person. She seems dead positive and lovely. I'm not going to criticise her. Being but positive doesn't make you a nice person. No, but, but I, th- I think she seems like a decent human being. But <laughs> she comes from a world that, I mean, I can't imagine. And one of the things she was saying, she wanted one of those date things. And it was a bit of a, like anybody, you know, if I've got a few minutes, I might, I might go through some nice videos online, yeah. a few minutes to get myself feeling in a good mood. And she was there and it came up with this dating, celebrities dating. And she was having an argument with the guy. The guy opposite with her was a staunch, you know, Labour. She was saying, how can you even say that? Look, I've not been given anything. And I, I honestly just wanted to vomit. Because number yeah. one, sweetheart, the Your way... tough. Y- yeah. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, end of story. Yeah. Your name's tough. And your clothes that you're wearing, my kids couldn't afford in five years, you know. And realistically, to suggest that this Tory mentality that anybody can make it in Britain, is absolute bollocks. Well, actually, another thing... When you're going on about university, what the people I know who have been to uni are actually frustrated because they're like, you know, I've worked hard, I've got a first semi degree, um, and I, I still can't, can't get, get a job. I can't get a great job at all. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I thought, like, I know someone who's got a first in their degree yeah. in London, and like, I thought, like, that you'd be on a hundred grand a year with stuff like that. No, no, it's just like, like, yeah, regular. the whole thing as well in the media. You guys work in the media, um, but guess we do, do we? Yeah, in, our, you're from Newcastle, team. right? Yeah. So you've broken the mould oh, yeah. because realistically, you broke the mould when they made me. That's for sure. In London, though, you know how it is, right? If you oh, want yeah. to get into the media, a lot of the time you have to do an intern. How are you going to do an intern if you're from Middlesbrough and you come from a working class family? How are you going to fund it? Yeah. But if you've got a dad who works in the industry or in trade or in banking and or a corporate lawyer, then bang on, you're going to get in. Yeah. How is that an equal society? And it really pees me off when people are like, anybody can do it. No, they can't. No. Anybody can't do it. I think anyone could do it, but they it doesn't mean you can. That's the problem. No, so what it's, I'm saying, what, it's I think real, what you're it's saying a real problem is, is and yeah. they, they, they paint it the wrong way. Because if you yeah. have all the hookups that you've just described, you can walk into a job. With me, I had to fly yes. in order to get where yes. I got. You know what I mean? That's it. That's exactly it. So even though you say you could... Imagine the amount of doors you have to walk no, through. And that's exactly my point. Is I, I think that's the that's the problem. Is that, that I'm talking more about the conservative mentality. Mm. Um, with big C. So many people triggered in the comments. Mm. I, but I don't. <laughs> I mean, it is that is. Uh, love yous, love yous all. Whoever you support. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, no, he's down, down on those people. But it is that is reflective of the conservative party is not a negative I'm just describing what the Conservative Party actually <laughs> say on their manifesto which is like you know we pe- everyone's got a chance blah 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 priv- they want yeah. to privatise everything it's basically an Americanization. And then, but there will be some culture. people listening who uh, just to put the other side across who will probably sit there and say well life isn't fair fucking deal with it that you know is know part I mean? of the problem is I think also there is a bit of a um a denial that a lot of things are actually just inherently unfair in life. Sure, mm-hmm. but we don't have to have a society that represents that because exactly. fortunately we are in a situation where it doesn't need to be that way. Well, you can change I it. agree that if you look at it at an untouchable in India, of course life's really unfair mm-hmm. and there is a hell of a long way to go before that kind of thing would ever get yeah. resolved, right? But in the UK, it wouldn't take a lot. It doesn't take a massive shift to make everybody have an okay standard of living because actually what the conservative mentality is and I don't have anything my mum's absolutely a Tory my she'll be a one. Tory till she dies it's as simple as that yeah mm, always we argue about it all the time she's absolutely entitled to her views and she's seen a different Britain so I get that her perception is different because she's experienced a different Britain. But the thing about the Tory mentality a lot of the time is if it's mine it's mine I've earned it but you have a privilege mm-hmm. of being where you are. Like I say to everybody, right, I was born to the right parents. I got literally applauded if I crossed the road, no matter how shit I was doing. Simple <laughs> as that. Got run over, they're still like, they, brilliant. Like, yeah, look how she survived that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. That's it. It's yeah. only a slight net wound. Coming. Took and roll. <laughs> Brace, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I know, I know that they reminded me of my possibilities not my limitations when everything was really a bit screwed up I think up. that's a, a great parent like you have to do that you have to tell your kids dream yeah you know what I mean don't put a ceiling on what they can do yeah well look at what you're doing now I mean who knew you know when you were that 14 year old kid you knew you, you knew you wanted to be successful uh-huh. you didn't know what that picture of success was uh-huh. but you wanted to do it and be it and I you I think I to be a doctor at the time if you were I, I think I'd like I wanted to be I went through that stage <laughs> yeah. I went through that stage I'm going to help people yeah I'm going to change the world um, brain surgery but you know you've done this and the thing about YouTube as well and I often get asked to comment on the negatives of online world and um, 
they'll, they'll ask you because unfortunately as a system we give so many bad examples to the <laughs> analyze so it's like and then me and him are like emptying the sea with a bucket right yeah like trying to do a bit but you know he doesn't want to be emptied but um, the, yeah but the thing mm. is that like online world has changed the world it changes the way that we communicate it makes everything open you know you can go online now and years ago you could feel so isolated whereas you can go online now and meet a thousand people who reflect your situation yeah. and you're suddenly not on your own and things like youtube and communicating with the masses that's such a privilege and power all in the same moment and as much as to some people that's like what a career you're a youtuber actually it's massive because one it's become democratic like the youtube demographic has made everything possible for people whether you are from newcastle or middlesbrough or manchester or the middle of nowhere can i caveat that with more democratic not a hundred percent no it's not a hundred percent democratic because now they've got loads of marketers behind rich kids so Mm, yeah so you hit the nail on the head there so it it kind of was it was about four or five years ago and now uh, the MTV and all right? them are aware of it. They're like, yeah, let's get these guys yeah. in. And the marketers have got onto yeah. it and that's what ruins it to some yeah. degree. But then they'll find a new way. That's the other thing. I always think that um, when you create those obstacles, people just get even more clever and the create more. Really good, they're like yeah. hackers almost. Yeah, yeah the hacking exactly. hacking system. Everyone's on site, like cryptocurrency now, aren't they as well? That's the next big thing. Even money is going to get challenged because yeah. people are going down the cryptocurrency route instead of having banks. And the banks are all really scared. And I love it. I'm like, I just there's a bit of me every day when I read it and I'm like oh, Bitcoin's really like worth this what is it you know who's ever seen a Bitcoin <laughs> right well, um, actually we had I a, think you saw a Bitcoin in the street the other day <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, we had an investor on recently didn't did we? you what did they say well he's only just getting he was the guy who behind you porn and fake taxi and that he, he's uh, he's investing a lot of money in that and of course he's, uh, he's addicted to it the rich get addicted. richer the rich yeah. get but what again the thing that blows my mind there is as much as it just rich people will just get really rich they'll just go like here's a million pounds and then they'll go, go up ten times and they'll get it out like what, nine million pounds more but actually what it says to me is there is a real change in the system like people are starting to say the banks you know they've let us down there's a lot of negativity associated with them we can do it our own way so the internet and the cyber world has both on a positive and negative level changed the face of our society i mean i just think to have been born into a time where i've got to see life without the internet you know i know that my life would have been so different if i had google at school because i've got a really good memory oh yeah <laughs> you know i'd probably done really well in things but back in the day it was like you went to the library Changing Your book everything. was out. People are yeah. having families now based on meeting people off the right. internet. They would have never have met. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's mind blowing. And also communication. I watch my kids and they communicate so much better than I did when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Like they're on the headsets, chatting to like 15 of the mates, you know, and it's quite close proximity mates. And they're all chatting and they feel like they've got this social life all the time and as much as some people can see the negatives and too much of it's isolating I get it I get it it. but at the same time I think wow I would have been mind blown when I was a kid but I've seen it you know I've been the kid who used to have to walk to my mate's house knock on she wouldn't be able to come out till after a tea (laughs) so I'd sit on the wall and an hour later and then we'd go wandering around for an hour hoping we might bump into any of the opposite sex for example that was our life always five at the time yeah yeah, that's right (laughs) we must go that was my (laughs) Pull your skirt down, they're just around the corner. (laughs) That was the selling feature. Yeah. But you know, (laughs) that's the deal, isn't it? At the end of the day, I've seen that change, and I don't think there's ever going to be a more prolific change in society as we've seen in the last in, 20 not in, years not in humanity no. no look at him it's like well until the sex bots come obviously I can see it going through your no, head I'm uh, waiting yeah. for that I'm looking forward to it the, the, they'll kill you bring on the sex yeah. bots it's I think horrifying yeah you'll exhaust death yourself death by snusu you'll yeah. exhaust uh, yourself uh, you will exhaust yourself um. yeah because the, the, the thing is <laughs> I think she'll run out of charge sorry he, he, he'll run out of charge before you get tired yeah, yeah. Um, is that true because you said you didn't discuss your sex life, but now we're all thinking oh, no, that you I, actually I'm a sharer. He's not. Yeah. He's not. I've, I've got stamina. That's, that's what we're brilliant. Saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you'll fuck a sex bot until it <laughs> until it dies. Out. Yeah, yeah. So, until it, his eyes just. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just <laughs> moving. We can't do this anymore. <laughs> Stop, Brian. Please, Stop. Brian. Yeah. Stop. Stop. For a place lubrication device. <laughs> yeah. Hilarious. So uh, <laughs> it won't be funny get, at the time. So so. 
you analysed murderers as part of your job, and and most Brilliant. people who are watching probably recognise you from Crime Investigation and all that the <laughs> channel. Britain's and and mo- I mean, I love the show. I'm absolutely addicted. Uh, and when you come up and you're like, tell him, and this is the point where he thought he was untouchable, and I'm like, yeah, you tell everyone. Do you know what I mean? What is it like to try and get inside the mind of a murderer? Well, I mean, I obviously work victims in my area, mm-hmm. but when I'm thinking about what motivates people to murder, obviously it's subjective because mm-hmm. every murder is slightly different to the other. But there are some traits that you can just read in mm-hmm. those humans, like particularly the ones that we cover on Britain's Darkest Taboos, they tend to be very premeditated, malicious killers. Mm -hmm. So there's real intent, Um, even from the younger people. We've only covered a few cases where, for example, young people have been intoxicated Mm -hmm. on cannabis and might be having a psychotic episode, you know. That's mental health, which is slightly different. Well, it's very different, actually. But the murderers that we... um, Well, I'll tell you what, very, very often... You will not get diminished responsibility for that. Right. Very often, there was a couple of cases that really um, stuck out in my mind with the younger people. When you mentioned that, there was one lad who was playing games against another guy, and then the guy came round and killed oh him. Oh my god! Did Brett you remember Bedner. those games? Brett Bedner, uh-huh. Lewis Danes, Lewis Danes, literally Lewis that Danes. Me up a bit, he that. is Why? serial killer in the making. Yeah. Lewis Danes. Now, what's really interesting about Lewis Danes is Looks that like from the Surrey area. Yeah, did he, he actually kill someone? Oh, it was awful. So you've been playing games against this, this, this smaller, younger lad, Brett Bedner, and, and, he, and he went round to his house and murdered him. When, when? Well, she. What what happened mm. was. Brett formed this relationship with Lewis Danes. Lewis was older, he fabricated this life, he'd come into some money. He'd had quite a disruptive life, to be honest, Lewis. But um, he'd come into some money, they think. And he had this flat, and he started to talk to this lad, Brett, who's amazing, really good family. His mum was an amazing mum. Had of a speaker as well. She's incredible. She would leave the door open, so she was aware that there could be predators online yeah. so she would listen she was aware that he was getting this relationship with Lewis and she started to be concerned because it felt like he was starting to dominate and control his life a little bit because Brett was excited he'd got an older friend and he was being told you know all these things were going to happen he was going to give him a job he was going to help him into the IT world mm-hmm. Brett was completely convinced of it his mum managed to try and kind of ease him away and then Lewis started being horrible about her so trying to convince Brett that she was yeah, wrong she's the enemy he went away on like an exchange Brett Spent a few days abroad, came back, told his mum he was going to go and spend the night with a friend. He went to Lewis Danes, and Lewis Danes tortured and murdered him in the most brutal, brutal of ways. And probably the most chilling part of that, when you talk about, you know, a killer, Mm -hmm. is the premeditated extent of the murder and then the cool calculated phone call to the emergency services. Oh yeah, his phone call. He, he was just stone cold. It, it was like, yeah, I've just been at the shops. Um, and he kept saying, that sort of. You, you need to just let me talk now. I need to just talk because what I'm going to tell you, let me just do it. And he would, he would control the conversation. He, he, he said to her, I am going to tell you and you're going to listen. That's exactly. Don't interrupt me. You know so what I mean? he, when you say, what are the kind of Gave killers there. that right. make me go cold? Yeah. He's it. Because I don't care what people say. I don't care what do you, do you know that he's actually he'll... attempted from, yeah. uh, to write to the mother from Well, prison. he did. Yeah. He set a blog up. He oh, managed right. to get access to the internet. He set a blog up, basically suggested that this was all, you know, fabrication. Mm-hmm. Because, of course, a, a true narcissist believes the world exists for them. Mm-hmm. So when you're working with somebody who is very, very dangerous and psychopathic, with those kind of traits, they see you and you. You're just collateral. You know you can be... Your extras in the movie, eight, that you. is their life. That's it. How mm. do you start to address that, though? Because that must be quite... Um, like, because you're dealing with someone who's mentally ill there. That, no. That's, so they're not mentally no. ill. No. But you're they're, dealing they're with sane. Someone, they're sane, but, but they have narcissistic tendencies. That, right. that, that's so hard to understand for, for people really like hard. me. Because I'm like... Say, how are they not in it? Because of the things that yeah. they've done are mental. What but there's makes, something wrong with their. There's something wrong with the way that their brains okay, work. Okay, so when you look at kind of, and again, there's some research on it. Um, well, there'll be lots of research on it, and, yeah. and it depends what you believe. But when you look at like the amygdala in the brain, right? Um, the kind of immediacy zone. Mm-hmm. You know, when you want to have sex, that's the zone that gets you want to eat. That's the zone that gets must you. Be huge. <laughs> well, Big if you average. are more altruistic, yeah. if you have more altruistic Make tendencies, you yes. will have a bigger amygdala. If you have psychopathic tendencies, you'll tend to have a smaller one. So we do see, as you're noting there, that there is, uh, to some degree, physical, 
physical, but it would not be impairment. It would not be impairment. Now, you do get, in the case of Fred West, for example, in the horrible murders that he carried out, he was organically impaired. He'd had a severe head injury on two occasions. You can see some links sometimes with severe head injuries and mm. that kind of behaviour, organic impairment. When it comes down to somebody like Danes, when it comes down to a real psychopath, what defines them is they know what they're doing mm. and they don't feel any conscience for it. So what mm. changes isn't necessarily their mental well-being, because people are mentally unwell so everywhere. If they mentally don't murder unwell, people. So for example, mentally ill would mean that he did it because he thought he was a ghost and he was like, right. oh, and then he snaps right. out of it and was like, what have I done? Right. That's mental right. illness. So that would be like a psychotic episode right. that makes you think aliens are here right. and you go mental on it, right? right. That's the way you go. That's just not how a psychopathic oh. kill. Some psychopaths can have mental illness with it, yeah. but you know, a true cold calculating. And if you, it, you know, this is my theory. And again, this is not steeped in evidence, so mm-hmm. kids don't go off and think that this is real. This is just my theory of it. I look back through evolution. And if you imagine that human beings evolve at a certain rate, and you know, until we got firing dogs, we were pretty much middle, right? We got eaten, and we got killed by things, and you know, in, and we could forage, and we could kind of survive on the scraps, right? We got fire, we got dogs. The dogs ate all the scraps, stopped infection. The fire meant that we, we could scare away animals that were there, and we went mental, right? Evolution just blew us up to the top of the, the kind of chain, right. yeah? So we became the predators more right. than the, uh, the hunted, so to speak. Through that as well, you have to have people who are willing to hunt and kill. It's just part of survival. So imagine in evolutionary terms, psychopaths would once have been important. If you were a Roman emperor, you wanted psychopaths Mm -hmm. who would kill on your orders without a problem, mm-hmm. without conscience. It wouldn't affect them. You don't want people falling apart because they've murdered people. Well, it's like if you're in the mafia, you, you want people who are going to be and hitmen, don't you? That's exactly, without any care. Mm. You know, with actually, like, it's just going for chopping. Mm. So, to some degree, our society has evolved to a point where we morally do not need them. You know, but maybe but nature still occasionally... they in, in the gene pool, aren't they? They're still here. Right, that's my idea, anyway. I'm not saying that's steeped in any evidence, but that I can see it as being, you know, if you look at DNA blueprints... We have people who are amazing givers, don't we? You know, we have the Mother Teresa's of the world, people far better it's than other people. It's about balance again, isn't it? That's it. But what about the dark ones? You know, there's got to be a genetic mm. mutation somewhere along the line where that What's can funny, happen. what surprised me is if you watch fighting and uh, like UFC and things like that, you see professional fighters and you would think that the, the psychopaths would probably gravitate into that, but most fighters are some of the most compassionate yeah. people like I've never looked at a fighter in a post fight interview before when they've just finished the interview and they're not like uh, like yes. they're, they're very yeah because they're getting it all out or, yeah. or whatever they're the yeah. most nice warm and loving guys and it's controlled as oh, well yeah. and that's another thing so like it's like we have killers in the army and the RAF yeah. and all of that we need them but most of those will really understand that this is a job and they have no joy in having to do that yeah. it's about keeping us safe right so the conscience is what allows them to do it occasionally a psychopath though, won't be like that like for example recently in America where you're seeing that guy who's on his knees begging for his life and the copper blows him away oh my god you will see where a psychopath has taken a job deliberately to uh, that's a tricky one. That's, a, that's really hard for that policeman, though, isn't it? What? Did you say that? Yeah, it's really horrible footage. But I, I think the guy... So it's, there's a re- He had his hands above his head. He had his saying, hands above his head, and then he's crawling, please. he reaches back to his waist, and it, he's drunk. They've In that situation, you know you know the backstory to that, where he had a gun in the room, and... Uh, uh, from To my knowledge, he didn't have a gun. Like, the guy who was shot down dead. Uh, are you talking about in the hotel? Yeah, yeah. The, the yeah. kid's pleading for his life, saying, please don't shoot me, yeah. and begging, and the guy just says, so, I'm going to kill you, so and he blows him away. From the reports that I read of that, uh-huh. the guy was a pest control um, guy <laughs> and had a gun to <coughs> shoot birds All right. and was showing his friend the sight or right. some, a new okay. feature on the gun. Someone else in the hotel saw the gun in the window and told the hotel. And obviously, you're pretty stupid to do that in the first it, place. Well, the way it come across, what I'm saying is, and we that was maybe it's a bad example, but, but yeah. you, you do see people who do take jobs to... Oh my God, of course. It's like yeah. pedophiles. You know, of course you create access. That's Have you had any encounters premise. with them in your job? Yeah, I'm really bad actually, because I actually, uh, I refuse to work with sex offenders does that make you bad is that or is that just sort of i think that as a professional it's really important to challenge yourself and it's just the area i have a black spot when it comes down to working and listen the spectrum of pedophiles is huge okay so 
one, a paedophile is not a child molester. A paedophile is somebody with a predilection and attraction to children. They can does that, also... Does that mean like a fetish, for example? But then well, they were, their sexual attraction. You're saying they won't act on that, necessarily. Ma- massive majority right. of paedophiles will not act. So, just while we're talking about this, because obviously you deal with people mm. and you... I deal with the victims of it And you deal. have um, a much bigger idea than I ever could, because I'm ignorant and I kind of want to be ignorant, you yeah. know, because you just don't want to think yeah, about that. no. When you say, like, you look at society, do you think that the numbers of them in society would probably scare people if we realised how many there well, are? Or, or are they just, like, a tiny little no, slither? The statistic of in the UK uh-huh. is that by the age of 16, one in four girls will have been sexually abused and one in eight boys. So one in six children will Jesus, be sexually abused by 16. No, it's but, prolific. So it, but it, is that by uh, someone who's... Uh, do you, you don't really want to call them a prolific sex offender, but sort a of repeated. Like some, someone who will go through a high volume of kids or is that by separate no I, I wouldn't abuses. say that there are obviously cases where we see paedophile networks where they go through a high volume of kids and one of the things that people don't understand in our society is just how rife it is um, uh-huh. and obviously people don't want to think about it because you know your children are the most important mm-hmm, things mm-hmm. in your life but it happens all the time and yeah. children are horribly abused in the UK and in other countries and children are born into situations where their lives are just completely torn apart by that abuse throughout. Yes, it is really rife and we see that throughout government, we see that throughout the media, Mm -hmm. we see it everywhere and this idea that paedophiles um, I will use the word child molester because, like I said, a lot of people can have predilections and attraction to children, but they know morally they would never act on it. And they actually seek cheap treatment. In Germany, when the X Factor's on, the adverts in between are treatment programs for men and women who feel attracted to children. It's a very Jesus. open dialogue to try to prevent, and it works very well. <laughs> it works very well. In the UK, we hide it away, or we have videos online of paedophiles being confronted by vigilantes, mm. um, and it what makes What do you think about go, that? Um, I completely understand why they do it. Yeah. I do. You know, retribution, wanting to protect children. Also, some individuals have themselves been abused. They've got a lot of rage and anger. Mm. The police can't deal with all the amounts of paedophiles out there. The problem that you do have, of course, is that very often they don't get leading to cases being actually answered because of that. A lot of them get off. But, and the other thing, if I'm really, really honest, is um, the families of those individuals have their lives completely broken. So the person who's in the video is one aspect of it. The ripples are huge. Please don't record and then put everything out on YouTube for a reason because it can ruin it like his wife. At least wives. people getting yeah. murdered. Yeah, exactly. It's as yeah. simple as that. So I have complete empathy and I would never judge somebody who goes out and do, does that because I do understand why. Mm-hmm. But, and I have worked in situations where I've seen how quickly paedophiles connect with kids, you know, really, really quickly. It's not tricky though to make a relationship with a child. Like no, it's I, not. I was at my uh, little cousin's house the other day and uh, someone else in our family had... This is going to be clipped up so badly. No, Do you know that guy who keeps uh, clipping up the podcast? Oh, right, yeah. And, um, <laughs> and sometimes, I love it. And sometimes... Um, so, and uh, they, they just had a kid and mm. this kid was running around and was friendly to absolutely everyone. Yeah. Like yes. they would talk to anyone Because he had no fear. Because he, he had no fear. Yes. And I'd never met the kid before. Yes. They don't know that we're somehow related. But like... Yes. That, it, they could have run over to Absolutely. anyone and that person could do and, literally, yeah. And when I talk about that spectrum, when you ask me about do I work with sex offenders, like I said, I've worked with one and I couldn't continue to do it. I just couldn't continue to do it. It was a female paedophile. and I just really? couldn't continue. See, th- so this is something to ask you about then because obviously we, the general public just think it's all men pretty much. No. What, so she was attracted to what, little She was involved in a paedophile ring. Kids. What, yeah. was she, she was a When you say involved, originally. was she attracted to kids? Like, was yes. She? So she had been in a network as a child oh, and right. then had become part of the perpetrating that abuse within that network. So that was a really difficult one for me to confront. That must be quite difficult for you because you realise that person's a victim of something which has then led to them then doing sure. that. So it's slightly different to... But most people who yeah. are sexually abused would find that's reprehensible true. the idea of abusing children. And that's one of the problems when you hear statistics like um, the majority of individuals who sexually abuse children have been abused 
So it's you'll hear that. As if it excuses right, it. Right, but uh-huh. also this idea that sexually abused people might abuse. Actually, the reality is the majority, the mass majority of people who've been sexually abused find sexual abuse reprehensible, would protect their children beyond any measure and can understand fully that they've been abused mm-hmm. and it's a terrible thing to do. The ones who go into it, I often wonder, is that a power thing? Is it a sense where you've had all your control and power taken off you as a child? So you imagine, well, if I can make sense of it by saying, well, I feel attracted to those children and acting that way have I then got control over what happens to me I don't know that could be something that plays into it but from my perspective we don't understand the spectrum very well in our society so you have at this end somebody who's attracted to children but also to males or females so they can have normal sexual relationships they can still be attracted to a child but never act on it right so that's the very very end of that spectrum right then you have here narcissistic psychopathic serial killer child molester that's how far it is and somewhere in the gray area is the average and when you talk to people who've been molested and sexually abused very often people have this idea that it will be this heinous horrific act that is terrible but the confusing thing for a lot of children is the paedophiles you know the really friendly neighbor who buys some treats and treats them like a princess or a prince and is loving towards them and forges a really strong connection with them and then by the time they start touching them well actually this is just a game and it's very difficult for a child who has had loving feelings and connection with this other human being to actually acknowledge they're a beast so that then leads into that whole cycle of shame where people feel they colluded with abuse. They didn't collude with abuse. You know, children yeah. can never collude with abuse. But you hear that narrative playing out in a victim's honestly all the time. You've explained that very, all very the clearly time. there for me. Like, all um, the time. You know, when you are uh, dealing with people who are the victims, and I'm sure that in the most extreme circumstances, is it hard for you when you go home and you, know, you put the kettle on and to just not think about everything you've been listening to all day? I really struggle in life with small talk. I always have done because all I do is deal with really core central issues of being human and so I suppose that's how it affects me. When I go home and I've had a particularly harrowing conversation with somebody or I've seen the hardest part is when you see the harm that people do to themselves when they're complete victims and they just don't deserve to hurt themselves in that way you feel it Mm -hmm. but you also operate constantly in a consistent belief of hope like I spend my life just hopeful so I get somebody who I have the privilege of walking through their territory with and going on that journey with them and it's agony for them but I'm looking down the line and I'm seeing the potential and all I'm trying to do is to almost put back in order the humanity that they feel they've lost and then add bits through compassion and caring and love you know I always say that I don't care whether it's ethical or not I feel a real sense of love for my clients you know because I want them to be able to replicate what we have in the room out there I want them to understand that whilst there are people out there who harm you there are also people out there who want to heal you and want to feel part of that journey with you so when I go home I tend to indelibly just feel like I'm privileged I don't work in scenarios with a lot of clients who pay for example I take money to work with corporate so big companies I do research for them and I charge them a reasonable amount of money I might do radio days and I really enjoy that and that allows me to continue to do the work that I do with people who are not able to afford therapy so because of that I get to work in very dynamic scenarios with people who've had really harrowing journeys and who have maybe not had the privilege that I've had as a kid being brought by a loving family and that constantly reminds me I'm not ever an expert I'm always learning and they're always teaching me and I constantly go home with that like a sense of I didn't know that or I didn't feel that or I've seen it from a different perspective and when we were talking earlier about grief and you said that gives you another element another area of your understanding the other time that that's happened when I had a two-year-old and a four-year-old just literally before my husband and me split up I used to run six miles every day, just done it forever. And it was a real therapy for me running. It's my therapy, mm-hmm. that physical release. You know, you obviously exercise. You know that real physical chemical experience like you? <laughs> just a bit, just a little bit. Um, and I was running and I burst into tears. I'd never done that. And I went home and I was like, something's wrong. So I rang my doctor and was like, I need to come in and see you. I went in and saw him. And 
they did test and my blood was really, really low. So I was like six two. I needed to go and have a blood transfusion. And after that, for three months, I can't describe what I felt like. I felt so scared of everything. I've never felt scared like that in my life. I had really acute anxiety. I would say I was really depressed. My parents would come round. This is ridiculous to recount, but they would come round to my house and I would cry after my, kid, my kids would go to bed. I'd put them to bed, being fine, you know, that old stiff upper lip. My parents would come round. I would cry for hours saying, you're going to die. How am I going to cope? That was my fixation and I did that for about three months and then I had another test and it turned out my iron stores in my body were just gone I had no iron no ferritin and I started having iron transfusions and physically within a couple of weeks I was absolutely great and there is a real link between iron stores being low and high anxiety it's depression. funny because I've known someone who um, has mood issues before and uh, and they have a massive iron deficiency. Right, and they're very bad at treating it in the UK. Mm-hmm. So until you get to low 14, they won't even give you ferrous sulfate, which are the tablets, which are rubbish, really. Actually, what you need is to be transfused. In really? America, if you are under 40, you'll get a transfusion, an infusion, they call it an iron infusion. It's half an hour, in you go, and it completely re-energises your system. And I had to teach my GP about that before I was referred. And it was like a miracle, you know, I've not been depressed or anxious ever since. But it taught me. Do you have to have like regular? Yeah, all the time, yeah. But it taught me how it felt to feel like that. And now when I work with people who have depression. You can empathize. Oh yeah, and you know I didn't. There was a bit of me that was like, right, let's just change your diet, go for a run, you'll be fine. Do you know what I mean? And I realized they're bloody warriors getting out of bed and coming to see me, let alone coping with day to day Mm -hmm. life. Because that is, uh, I guess, it's quite, it seems like quite a trivial thing uh, yeah. in the first place, it's just sort of iron deficiency. Yeah. Um, the, wor- the worst thing is, though, like, for example, getting out of bed and all of that, it's not just that you're finding it hard, it's that it feels worse because everyone else finds it easy. Yeah, and that's such a good way of like, looking at it. Fucking hell, I'm really shit, yeah. It's bad enough I feel like shit, everyone else is doing what I kind of do. I think that's a really good way of looking that, at it. That's exactly it. It's so. like if you're running a race and like you're literally like crawling off the finish line, everyone's lapping you and you're yeah. like, it's bad enough I can't even get off running and everyone else is making this look terrible. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that that's a lot of that self-shame, you know, mm-hmm. that feeling that you should be, in, going back to what we talked about at the very beginning, the idea that life is meant to be this ABC linear experience mm-hmm. and when you're not on the track in the way that everybody else is, you think there's something wrong with you. And also the impatience that we have with mental Honestly. illness. Like have massive, we all have a massive impatience with mental illness. The amount of relationship counseling I've done with people who've got a partner who's really sick with depression and they're just angry with them. And I understand why, because you know, living with somebody who's depressed when you've got a family is quite limiting for you. But well, because you almost become their carer, I guess. And also they can't motivate themselves to do the things that ordinarily you would do. Yeah. So you kind of feel this resentment and frustration and young people who feel depressed as well you know when they're looking on social media and everybody else's life just looks like shiny and beautiful (sighs) and you're looking at Kim Kardashian you know who's made ludicrous amounts of money because of a massive arse you know and at the end of the day they're saying what is it about my life that means that I've not been able to achieve and then they've already got this chemical imbalance or this emotional imbalance and it's a cooking pot of mm. mental sadness. Do you know what I mean? It's very rare you see someone famous just treat a picture or post a picture on Instagram and go, I fucking feel like shit today. Do you know, you're right. And Davina McCall, mm. before Christmas, she's obviously just broken up with her husband. Right. She put out a video, dead brief, and it was just her saying, I understand that people are lonely and this is how it feels, I understand. Mm. And all she did was get absolute shit online. What do you know about loneliness? And again, the thing about loneliness, mental illness, well, cancer, let's be mm-hmm. honest, any kind of illness, it doesn't, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care whether you're a successful, wealthy individual or somebody who's really poor. It happens. So the, the rhetoric online a lot of the time is people can open themselves up and then people attack them for that. So we have an impatience per se with things that don't go the oh, right yeah. way. Do you know what I mean? Well, I, I, Do you get it online all the time? Well, I did a video recently where I was uh, crying, unfortunately. Oh, right? what happened? And, uh, well, that Logan Paul fella was um, giving it that and doing some stupid things where you're showing this dead body and, oh, it's and I was saying I get a lot of messages of people who watch me and I ended up crying because of these people who send us all these messages and they feel really down and I feel bad yeah. for them and I noticed so much support but you did I did see the odd person just being like ah you're crying for views and all that I'm like isn't it sad really, though that people really see that mate. do you know what I mean 
particularly when you look at men of your age, mm-hmm. the biggest killer is suicide. Mm-hmm. It's as simple as that. The biggest killer of guys your age is suicide mm-hmm. because people don't talk about their feelings. People don't feel they've got a permission base to talk about the feelings. And I hated that video that he did, by mm-hmm. the way. I know he's lost loads of people following him, but he's probably got the biggest viewed video ever, hasn't he, that that guy with the dead person hanging. Mm -hmm. What I thought was interesting, though, was that people were berating him for laughing. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. Actually, what's really ironic is when I watched his reaction, it was not an unusual reaction to that kind of scenario. You know, you don't know how to react. You react kind of laughing and giggling, being a bit childish. I think it was the jokes he made. Yeah, after, after that's it. That oh, he's an absolute tool. Yeah. He's a tool. Huh. And the thing Nailed is, it. we often celebrate that kind of completely antisocial behavior because it kind of well, looks that's a bit edgy and different. There's yeah. a lot of psychology behind the way that he was acting as well, though, wasn't there? Because mm. he's also part of a group which is all about affirmation and sort of about approaching life and anything that any challenges that you come up against in life, you know, we laugh it off. And as a group, I imagine they were quite affirmative about the video. Yeah and there's sort of a mentality to that that they couldn't no one there knew they were doing something wrong I know it's the untouchable side of it as oh, well yeah. the invincible yeah. side they, they, they think they've, that they are this better this reward that they've had for the last god knows how many years that's it every time they do this ignorant shit yeah. they get praise for it yeah. all, you, all you do is you're in this frame of mind of oh the more radical exactly. mad shit I can do the exactly more get my praise. kids literally hate those brothers mm-hmm. they cannot bear them and there's quite a lot of lads and girls who talk about those individuals mm-hmm. you've probably done it here and he watches those videos because it just validates mm-hmm. those feelings of like how are these guys making so much money how's he bought another four Bill, million pound house Bill and Ted house? did it way better I just have to say that right Bill now Bill and Ted did what? do it way better just the dude sort oh, right. of yeah. <laughs> I don't actually think it's a dude act I don't think it it's he's a white middle class jock yeah, that's, that's what not, he is. That's not cool. No, it's not. White people are lame, man. No, like, um, <laughs> but, but he's yeah. middle America. He's definitely, you know, he's had a nice, affable life. He's been affluent. It's as simple as that. Is, is, is it like his, was his brother in, um, what the fuck is it? Um, <laughs> Disney Channel. No, there's, no, his older, apparently they've got older brother in Breaking Bad. Was his older brother in Breaking really? Bad? Really? Is he, is he the little pill head who's in Breaking Bad? Oh, I've not seen Maybe Breaking Bad. Everyone tells me is to watch true, it. Is that true, no, uh, it's not. Someone told me that the other the day. The commentator's shaking his no, head. It's not, yeah. He doesn't comment. Con, con comes in handy for some stuff. Yeah. The thing about the public, though, is that they're quite discerning in the end. I think that people can be really, really popular and do really, really well. But in the end, if you go too far, the public are just like, particularly young people. See, this is. I've worked a lot of my life with younger people. Um, I really have enjoyed like the age groups of like 15 to 25, particularly with 15 to 19 and then being one of my major areas. And I just see that these kids know so much more than people give them credit for. They mm. see the world in ways. And it's a bit like when you look back at being 15, obviously I thought I knew everything at 15, but at the same time, I know I was calculating and thinking and analyzing and really thinking about the way that the world works, but not being necessarily taken that seriously. And young people nowadays, because of things like YouTube and this kind of voice, they've got a voice of access that can literally explore the way that they feel and share and get validation and that stuff about likes is really interesting you know there's research out saying that young people really react to the liking you know when they get the likes the more likes it kind it, of it is a little bit of an addiction i think for some people well again yeah and that's what a lot of the research is kind of indicating but actually one of the things that they found is it's dopamine that's getting released a little hit of dopamine because but dopamine people are praising you yeah but dopamine actually isn't it's not an addictive thing it's just like a little Mm-hmm. nice one mm-hmm. you know and, and that's not a bad thing but mm-hmm. it's more about you know young people are searching for validation who isn't searching for validation it is a lot like you've got to that stage now where you're like I'm okay I'm you know I always say to people we're all going to get old and ugly we're all going to die that's a real equaliser yeah. so stop worrying about the things that you think are so important like the face the body all it is is something to get you from A to B you know it's A it takes to a B takes a long time to let go it, of that though yeah and the, really but the earlier the earlier you can get it the luckier you are yeah the more we talk about it the more that you know you talk but to we're, we're going away that. from that I, I think if anything uh, in sort of I don't know people who are like 50 and over in their day because there wasn't social media and scrutiny over every little picture and every no girl can take a fucking picture without a filter on these days I'm like I'm looking on Instagram I'm like has everyone got a dog nose now or is this just how people had surgery like every girl is taking a picture of the filter on and and it's not their fault it's because they feel so fucking scrutinised exactly Um, and sexualised and objectified that's the truth of it as well Mm. I mean don't get me wrong lads have got but even by each other though by each other I think girls probably look at each other's pictures more than lads lads are just like oh 
I agree. You know what I mean? I agree. I think there's a, a lot thing. of judgment mm-hmm. towards girls' bodies full stop. Mm-hmm. The whole society is set up of a Western cultural perspective about what a woman should look like and want. It's completely skewed. And it's doing what you're talking about. It's making girls feel that they have to right the world with their bodies. You know, that as long as they look a certain way and have that picture like that in the oh, room. Oh, God. Every 3, picture is from times. the fucking skyscraper. Like, I mean, every. It, it, Exactly. Just take your one head off and you look perfectly nice. Exactly. So they're very aware of that. Mm -hmm. And the thing about marketing is that, you know, they've done it really well because marketers have created this. You know, this is all about let's chip away at your self esteem piece by piece as early as possible so that in the end we can sell it back to you product by product for the rest of your life. I do think that's the key. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, especially when we're talking about sort of the hero narrative, those sorts of things. People just twist that a little bit every now and again. So for a little, for a little yeah, while, right. there's a very strong narrative of dieting. For a little while, there's a very strong narrative of um, eating properly. And then, and then when people overeat, they go back to the narrative of everyone being overweight. And it's basically now, I think a lot of people are quite cynical of... Pe- I think a lot of people were cynical of you crying because they think you've got something to sell. You think you've got your own product to sell. They think no, you're gonna make money I've been trying to get a t-shirt off for fucking years, mate. I still can't manage it. But, that, but, that, but the point is that it, it, it does teach people to be cynical because there's it's... We're basically just always flipping the story over and over and over again to no, try and it, yeah. push your own, whether you make money off it, whether you get social status, there's some sort of status or something, whatever you get off it. There's always something behind it and people are learning to second guess that a little. Yeah, but I mean, in human behavior, to some degree, there is always a motive, isn't there? I don't know whether you ever yeah. watched Friends years ago where Phoebe was trying to be altruistic and she just felt good about it, so she couldn't yeah, be altruistic, yeah. you know? Yeah. But there is always a motivation. Um, I think it's sad, though, that when people demonstrate real emotion, for example, crying, albeit on a successful channel, you immediately want to kind of... No, it's very successful. You want to kind of have people react with compassion is, as is opposed it? to, yeah, yeah, why are you doing that? Because you want likes or you want loads of comments or you want to get loads of views so you get more marketing. That's sad because what that says to every boy who goes on and watches that is that's what people think, that I'm weak or I'm stupid or I'm doing it for a different reason. Mm. And um, You can't just feel anything yeah. for nothing, for no, like, for no gain, yeah. so, so if those especially com- not on a camera. Yeah. If those comments, though, are empty in the first place or to some extent are empty, then do we have to weight those comments in a certain way? Because I think we, you get, all of what we've all said is given an awful lot of weight to the social media or the comments that you get on social mm. media. And actually, I think you, you address it in the video, which is it's not really about the likes or the comments or the, the money you're going to make off the video. That if, if one person sees it and they feel like they can talk to someone because of that, that's probably exactly. way more important than 100,000 exactly. comments below the video. That's exactly it. Yeah, and you know, as well as I do, you know, I get comments about myself from people who literally want to murder me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I've annoyed them that much. Well, you, you break them down psychologically and say, I don't think you can. Some, <laughs> sometimes I just engage and I'm nice to them and yeah. they're okay. Um, or sometimes I correct the spelling because I really don't like it if somebody says they can't deal with me and it's spelled, you know. It annoys the psychopath. The wrong way. Yeah, spelling. I'm like, yeah. don't, that's the wrong so way to never, <laughs> The thing is, um, in the role that you're in usually on TV and uh, I wouldn't have thought that you would have come under that that type of scrutiny and oh, criticism. people think I'm really annoying some people really yeah of course like oh, I totally get that yeah no, exactly no, that's no, yeah. exactly it because I, I suppose one of the things is as well I get quite a lot of exposure during a certain period of time like something will happen where I'll be in a series and then there'll be three other series on repeat from like yeah. three years ago so in the end they're like is nobody else available for <laughs> yeah. these shows and I, also personalities you know people like or dislike you cause the reaction you can't help it it's just the way it goes is you it know women or, women? Do you get a, or is it quite mixed women are actually very rarely off women actually men and younger men is that because you're a woman no I'm thinking I'm trying to think why is it that well specific? I'll get it with the classic one what is the I usual love thing this one. The classic one is, oh, for fuck's sake. All she does is talk common sense. <laughs> That's some insult, that. That is the Thank one. you very much. That's what <laughs> I was like, going for. I, I literally, I'm like... Fucking hate her I'm in like, a common sense. I know. It's like so obvious. And 
the art of what I do is to take something that's quite complex and explain it in a way that's quite Simple easy to way, understand. Yeah. And I so, love that. Yeah, when you explain something really hard and then they, and people go, yeah, I know. I know. And you're like, you didn't, but I have just broken it down really well. And that's you. one of the biggest myths that I held for a long time in therapy was that people understood what they were thinking and doing. And yeah. I've realized over the years that a lot of the time you actually need to give quite clear and obvious advice. And people are like, oh my God, I've never thought about doing it. The, this assumption that I used to make that people thought in a way that I thought was quite linear, it's rubbish. So I've had to learn a lot about the fact that sometimes the glaringly mm. obvious to me is the most disguised to another human being and to shine that light on yeah. it and to help them move on and progress. When, when I went through the hardest time of my life... What it, happened? Basically, I was in a really dark place. Someone had died in the family oh. and, and generally... It felt like everything was just Closing crumbling. In. The whole thing, like everything that could yeah. go wrong, had was gone going wrong. wrong. And a, a close f- um, family friend who was like um, an older woman, just was who was very good at what she calls ironing out your thoughts. Amazing. And I'd just sit and have a cup with her, and I'd just sit and talk and talk. And this is why I've been telling people you've got to talk at this yeah. point when you hit that uh, yeah. rock bottom. And um, she wasn't um, trained in any way, but she had a very natural ability Mm. to help you map things out. Yeah. And once I'd sat and just heard heard myself what was in there, and I just let it all come out, I'd walk out of her house and I'd feel like clear and like, all right, this is helping actually. That speaking your truth and having someone to bear witness to it is just such a powerful experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, your mum's a counsellor. Yeah. So you've grown up with that emotional literacy. Yeah. Yeah. So in relationships, I'd imagine that the women that you've had relationships with kind of see that side of you being quite literate you'd hope so <laughs> <laughs> no no but I think um, I, I, love that. The postcard. I was just waiting for his little response there I knew it was going to be a good yeah. one <laughs> I, um, I think I think it's been interesting because actually um, you're an emotionally uh, mature man yeah uh, I don't know I think a lot of I think I've had real insight into like also the like angst of a counselor as well and like how or a psychologist or those side of things mm. because I imagine when you lost your friend and I'm, uh, I, that that's incredibly difficult you can't necessarily counsel people for that subject for a little while after that or you have to sort of step away from that because maybe you're too emotionally close to it it's an interesting one because um, actually what I felt was that it was a really empowering experience as but a practitioner in the days after though I imagine that must be quite difficult to kind of it's step in it's a strange in. one when my husband left me well I, I threw him out he'd had an affair when my kids were two and four I've I, I seen an article about yeah. this on Google when I googled you yeah and you actually right. said uh uh, he did me a favour was the oh, quote yeah. that they used. He, he did me a real and I'm really I get on really well with my ex-husband he's mm. got two new children well, just about to have his second child and uh, we're a really dysfunctional functional family you know it's as simple as that my husband and him get really on really well you know he pops in for a brew there's, there's no animosity we just weren't in the right relationship but when I asked him to leave it was two o'clock in the morning and I had to get up the next day to go to work and I went into work and I had my little clinic um, in Openshaw in Manchester it's a massive college and I would saw my manager and just said I just need to check in with you to say that my husband and me split up last night and she was like go home and I was Mm -hmm. like I'm not going to go home I want to be here and she's like I'm really not sure you should be here after that and I said the truth is I know that today in my room every single young person that comes is fighting a really really big battle you know dealing with it if they can make it to my room I'm going to make it to my room And, and I genuinely felt at the end of that day, it just did me so much good. So Sense when, perspective in a way. when yeah. Pam died, actually what I felt was this true connection to grief. Like it mm. was quite a beautiful connection. It's devastating, you know. I know what you mean but by it's that. it's beautiful. Though. Because when you're pouring your heart out about how much you love someone, yeah. it sort of teaches you a lot about yourself of, wow, this is how much I can love someone. Yeah. And it sort of makes you realize you're actually a pretty good person. Yeah, and the crying, you know the crying oh, catharsis. Yeah. I don't think I've ever cried Mm -hmm. like I cried and my boys will say to me when Pam died when we you didn't really cry very often it was like I did but I cried contextually you know or at Christmas you know I got my grandma's sherry glass out because my grandma's died and Mm -hmm. I poured a glass of sherry Mm. don't know why I don't even drink sherry but obviously it's Christmas so you should drink sherry sherry's great Uh, yeah half a bottle of it's great you Mm. know that little glass wasn't great yeah yeah that's my psychology (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's right she says it's all right ignore the who guidelines it's absolutely fine go Mm. straight for a bottle of it yeah yeah but um, I poured it obviously half then Mm. Um, but I (laughs) poured myself a glass and I was sat with my husband at the table, the kids had opened the presents and 
I kind of said, I'm just going to toast my friend. And I literally just burst into tears. It's like triggers, isn't it? Honestly, and yet I'd felt mm. like, but the allowance and permission of just letting it go. I don't know what, the only way I can describe that catharsis, which is why anybody who's listening who feels like you can't show your emotions because you're going to get judged, mm. the catharsis when you just let it go. Yeah. Oh my God, it's like taking the deepest breath, isn't it? I mm. used to have a, 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 a point of where I sort of knew it was going to come, which was usually music. Yes. Yeah, if so, I listen to a, a, a so song nostalgic. that relates to a person then I know it's it's on the way. It's so true. Do you know true. what I mean? You sit up in the car, you'll just be driving somewhere and you'll think, I better pull over. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, in the UK, often people say that grief lasts, you know, a, a certain period of time and everyone yeah. expects you to be back in the office and working six weeks after. For a significant loss, they believe the process truly is about seven years. Do you know that's so weird? Because I was thinking seven years in my head. That's it took about, me about seven years. Yeah. Uh, and I remember when I lost um, my close friend, um, yeah. it was... I remember thinking to myself, how the hell do people fucking go to work after this shit? Like, yeah. I know people who've lost people and straight back into work within yeah. a couple of weeks. I'm like, you haven't been on holiday, mate. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. how the fuck do people do it? Yeah. Because I pretty much just went, hit the destruct button, and every um, everything I could take that was going to make yeah. things worse, I was taking. I know, but the thing is, you know, I often work with people who, like, alcohol is a really good example, mm. and people who drink really heavily after somebody dies. But, Alcohol's ironically, even though it's a depressant, yeah, we know all that, it also blacks stuff out, doesn't it? Alcohol's one of those things mm. that you drink it, and if you drink enough of it, it just bloody disappears. I couldn't sleep myself, so that's where, exactly. that's where I was turning to. Yeah, and it's one of those things. Yeah, I totally get that. Mm. It's that thing of, I'm just going to, I remember when Pam died, you know, there were a good few times I was just like, I just need vodka. So, you know, and that's what I do. And like, even though I did it minimally, because I kind of am quite a... Uh, Analyst and I'm very you know good writing. You know what's fair. And also, I would say to my husband, "I'm going to get blasted, mm-hmm. and I'm doing it for this reason because today I don't want to feel as much, you know." Right. And he was very supportive in that, and it was never ridiculous. But I would do it, and I knew, and that's a really honest thing for the me to say. But you know, I knew are that sensible I, in that no. way, and and have a husband maybe who can be like, "Or right, you keep an eye on me." Yeah, it's exactly. One night, the night, exactly. and then that's it. and then as long as one night doesn't turn into four, four exactly. But like you said, when you were going through that, it's this expectation that, well, one, it's a friend, so mm-hmm. big deal. Do you know, that's one of the attitudes that yeah, people have. You know, if you're at work and you work for a local authority or you work for a private company, you get maybe, if you're lucky, one day off for a funeral of a close relative. Yeah. I mean, forget your friend. Your friend's out of the picture. They're oh, not yeah. even a close relative. And you think to yourself, that's how completely dysfunctional we are about grief like one of the biggest biggest experiences we go through in our life none of us escape it every single one of person in this room is going to get that phone call one day and it's going to devastate us mm. but even though we all go through it everyone's like oh let's just put it into this box and make it a synergy where everybody can just function and get on with it and then we wonder why people are alcoholics or people are holed up isolated in their own homes or are taking whatever drug they're going to take or having promiscuous sex because we've hurting and when we're hurting, you look for we have to find mm. something to make it better. And what makes it better is what you said, connection, communication, bonding, love. But our society is fractured now. And what's happening is we're all living in little boxes away from each other. And that's the irony. The answer's there, and it's simple. But for some reason, our society, because of the capitalism and the kind of materialism and the, I have this, you have that, it stopped the very thing that we need. And when we talked at the beginning, and again, not to go back to politics and slag off Taurus, it's not about that, but that every man for himself mentality, that's the worst thing for us. Mm -hmm. Because you know how it is when you sit down and you feel people around you just with you. It just, it's something magical it's something magical that happens it's just this sense that we were okay my sister came around at Christmas because I had a really just a shitty day and her and her husband turned up and my sister's top note as a woman she's like you know Mm. she'll ring me and say she's devastated because there's a a sink leaking you know it's that language but she's ace Mm. and she turned up and she just came and gave me a hug sat down and just talked to me for a couple of hours and he did as well and he's not an emotional guy her husband but they were just there and you know it wasn't even about what they said it was just that they made the effort they knocked on that made me a cup of tea I think that 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 was one thing that I realised when uh, when I lost that person 
was how many people avoided us yeah because of the pain that I was in yeah and people who I thought would show up and be there or they such were, common story and, and, and sometimes people who I didn't think were going to be there came yeah and I was like wow this teach this taught me a fuck ton about life there it really does. it made us me made us realize just who I could count on and yeah. who I couldn't count on people say I'm afraid of saying the wrong thing there is no wrong thing there's no wrong thing but, just say stuff but people are people or people are selfish a lot of people and they don't want to put themselves through having to be in your presence yeah. and know that you're in that pain because what that reminds them is that this pain is here and this is real and it's going and to happen to them for as them well to go back into their life and, and be happy and live their thing knowing that you're going through this so yeah. they'd rather just look after themselves it's really painful though isn't it when you are the person who has lost and mm. instead of having that community and continuity of care from the people that you have in your life they just desert you and abandon you well, and that abandonment is awful yeah, yeah. even though think, you can see like you're saying and thinking there even though you can see the reasons behind mm. it it yeah. feels that way yeah exactly I think that's quite difficult because I think also that when people grieve sometimes I think they bl- there's a lot of blame there's a lot of anger there and sometimes that can get taken out on other people as oh, well yeah. I've definitely seen friends go through that when they've sort of lost I think some people lost very close relatives, that sort of thing. I've not sort of lost grandparents, but I don't really think that's the same experience as losing someone that mm. close. And I think it diffic- it's it's a really isolating process. And Definitely. You must feel angry in that as well. Yeah, anger is the second stage of grief. So yeah. it's a big part of it. Sometimes it lasts a day, sometimes it lasts years, mm. you know? Grudges become. It's that sense, sort of yeah, it's that sense that it's unfair. Yeah. Why has it happened and all of that? But it's the only reason for life, death. You know, that's it. It's the only thing that gives value. If without death, there is no value of life, you know? Without knowing that something has the potential to leave you, you can't truly manifest its importance. So I kind of look at destruction and decay, which is part of our experience, as actually something that's almost pregnant and empty all in the same moment. It's a gestation of life that ends with death, and it's imperative and important that we acknowledge and come to terms with it, Mm -hmm. but that we transfer what we've learned, like you're doing, with your friend and like I'm doing with my friend it's about going god you know I was so blessed I I genuinely like I think about her a million times a day I text her phone still there are things that I know that I'll and I know that you'll feel exactly the same the conversations that you no longer can have because you had that relationship Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. laugh I had a laugh that only she shared you know Mm -hmm. we laughed in a certain way there were looks that I didn't need to explain anything Mm -hmm. there were things about our relationship that are completely gone forever I can never recreate them with anybody else but I hold that and think wow you know I had like a long time well one of of the only things that gave me comfort at the time was Wherever they are, that's where I'm going as yeah, well. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. It's a really good philosophy, and it, I think it gives you great it's, comfort. Death is not it? an exclusive club. Do you know no. what I mean? It's it's welcoming everyone. At it one point. is. No one's going to escape. Exactly. That door's going to open. So I just thought the the logic that I had to get from, which you're quite similar to me in that sense, you have to find the logic. Yeah. Is um. Well, might as well enjoy the rest of my time here that's instead it. of just sitting being miserable. Then Absolutely. because I'll be there one day anyway. Do you know? Since my best friend died. We would talk endlessly, endlessly about what we were going to do, you know? And she was going to buy... So she'd had quite a difficult time. Her husband had died five years earlier. She'd met a new guy who was amazing and could not have loved her more Mm -hmm. at the end, could not have loved her more. But five years earlier, her husband had died. And she spent, like, the next few years dealing with her grief, and we would talk a great deal about it, talking about what she was going to do when, what she was going to do when. And I would kind of do that. as well. oh, I'm going to get a different house. I'm going to move, blah, blah, blah. The minute she died, I was like... I'm doing it. I'm going to do all the things that I wasn't going to do because it was just talking. And I put my house up for sale. I bought two more dogs. I went away and travelled. I've planned things that I would never have planned because I am not going to allow myself to think that I have tomorrow. I'm going to do it all. It teaches you how precious it is. So now you're actually using it. And make action. Mm -hmm. Don't don't sit ever. And this is the thing that I would say if I had a message for anybody and definitely for my own children... Don't think that you have that time, you know. Don't make plans to make plans that never happen because you're afraid of what happens if you try and activate them. Like, if you want it, do it. 
if you want to try it, try it. It's better to make a fool of yourself doing something new and realise it's not for you than to never do it, you know? I do think that's actually, that goes back to what you were talking about from being young as well, is mm. uh, it's very difficult as a young person to, it, you, when you hear advice, you think, yeah, yeah, that's all well and good. Something that you have to go through it and mm. practically do it. Yes. So the more you can engage those Exactly. Knowledge is never and, enough. Yeah, experience it. Because an old person, maybe an old person can, uh, an elderly person can tell you something that will send you down the path to go and do it. It's very rare an old person will say something and then you won't do it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? The likelihood is you'll touch fire once or you'll do something like that just to find out because yeah. you're a kid or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And you yeah, almost yeah. have to. Yeah. And that's partly, I think, the advice that I give to a lot of people when they email me and say, "What would you? How can I get into your career?" I'm like, "Just go and do it. Like, actually, go and." Yes. People are really good yes. at, at bullshitting themselves and like, just telling themselves, "Oh well, one day when? it's coming down yeah. the motorway and it's going to come to me." No, like that's you it. actually have to get off your ass and I do think something. Thirty is probably a really good time for that as well. Uh, well, it's, you... it's a reckoning, isn't it? It makes you look back and think, "Fuck me, I'm 30. Yeah. <laughs> no, but no, also, no. You're, but also, the good thing about thirty is you're not quite at the point where you're considered no, over the hill. So you're you, supposed you're, to be. In your prime you're still salvageable. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm unsalvageable. You're yes. right at the beginning. No, but yeah. I just mean like, yeah, I'm supposed to be in my prime now. This is supposed to be me at my me peak. You are and, in your prime. Look at you. And I'm just saying, <sighs> um, I think people are generally good at telling themselves eventually things are going to end up the way I want them to without actually doing anything. You've got to be in the driving seat. So when seat. someone dies, it makes you pull your head out your ass and go, fuck me, this isn't forever. This is temporary. I better do some shit right now. That's exactly you it. You know what I mean? And that's such a good philosophy. Because uh, also, feeling the fear, that classic title of the book, feeling the fear and doing it anyway, mm. you know, courage comes from fear. You have to be afraid before you get brave. It, and brave reinforces, you know, the whole context that so you can continue to do that. It does sound quite a lot like a lot of your approach is about affirmative and yeah. affirmation Listen, not necessarily affirmations right. but being aff affirmative because it sounds a lot like a lot of the time uh, you just describe bad situations in a positive way that's it and yeah. the reason I do that is for two major concerns because the actual neural pathways in your brain change when you think positively right. so we can clinically see how it impacts really? so I know that when Nick I Yara make myself do that it does well. it Yara does it changes the neural pathways yeah. and secondly I know that when I am nice and positive other people around me are nice and positive or I impact on their negativity right, yeah. and so my life feels better like one of the things that I look at to see whether I am like just delusional because obviously I could believe all this and people could be walking around going what a dick you know what I mean and that's fine um, because you know that can happen but I look at my kids yeah and like last night we sat it just sounds ridiculous people will be like how is she allowed to have therapy with anybody mm. but last night you know my kids came down at like nine o'clock and uh, I was having a glass of wine with my husband we don't usually drink in the week but we're having a glass of wine um, judging judging yeah that's it judge me and my, it's my mum's fault she bought me six for Christmas so I was like oh, oh it is a bit like that in January six bottles of yeah, everyone's six like dry January wine. I'm looking at my fridge going how the fuck am I going to get through January without drinking this did she buy you anything else just six bottles of wine um, she built, bought me a couple of bras that didn't fit if you really want to know <laughs> fair enough Did you know what it's been? Luckily, we've got someone yeah. at the table yeah. right here. Four or five years of the wrong size bra, literally every year. I'm waiting for the one when she hits it. Probability says by 93, she'll mm. get it right. Roughly, even yeah. by then, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You never know. But um, but yeah, so I was sitting down and my lads came downstairs and my your eldest is really emotionally literate. My youngest is literate, but my, my eldest is just like, I became a single mum when he was four. So there was a lot of like team stuff. You know, we were a team. My, my youngest lad kind of came into that, but we were very, very emotionally aware. And I've taught him a lot. We talk about everything. No subjects off the table. My my lad knows that he can talk about anything with How me. How old is he now? He's 15. Right, he can talk okay. about porn, dating, sex, confides in me about everything. Like he'll keep secrets. Of course he does. He's, he's allowed to, you know, but I, I trust him implicitly in that way. But he'll say to me, I don't get, I don't get people who are depressed and, his friends will tell them, mm -hmm. tell him, and he really wants to work around that with them. And he'll go, I just kind of feel like pretty happy all the time. And when things go wrong, I just kind of think, well, be one week wonder or I'll get over it, which is language that my mum taught me when I was a kid. You know, one week wonders never feel like anything's going to last, just it's a one week wonder. And he's got that. But we sat around the table last night and I had had a glass of wine, so I was probably a little bit more receptive. And we just do this stupid game. It's a silly game. And it's like, you know, I'm thinking of an animal. It begins with the letter U, right? And my eldest son just throw yeah exactly I know I don't can't think of one as well he throws words out and it's hilarious and we sat there unicorn unicorn oh, really yeah you can't it. it's mythical so, but we sat again. around the table can't and we were doing that and Same, it was yeah. it was that immersion in 
the most extraordinary ordinariness of life and how bloody brilliant it is, mm -hmm. but also how being positive and creating that atmosphere in my household of positivity. My husband's hilarious. I mean, he's from Saltburn and Middlesbrough. That's Middlesbrough where he's born, grew up mm -hmm. in Saltburn. He's the same. He, he takes everything and makes it funny. Everything. You know, I'm not saying we're always appropriate with our humour. I would hate to have dispatchers secretly filming me. But nonetheless, that's the way we are in our world. And so positivity, yeah, affirmative experience. And just like this belief that no matter what, I'll cope. It's not even that I'm not going to go through horrible times. I will. My mum and dad are going to die. Like, that'll be terrible. When my cats died, that was awful. You know, when my best friend died, that was terrible. I've had horrible things happen to me in my life. But... The truth is I've always known that I can get through it because I'm hardwired to survive, every single human being is. And in the darkest of moments, I just see that there is always that flicker. And it's not about being a blind optimist. Mm -hmm. It's about being a very, very real People don't realise real the strength they've got until no. they actually... Like my, my dad recently is split up with his lass. Oh. And um, he's bloody useless, right? He's <laughs> nice, absolutely fucking useless. He's had a he's had a woman look after him his whole entire oh, life, God. and he's had a lot of women. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and and he was like panicking about being on his own, and I'm like, Dad, man, you're I'll in cook your, for you. I went, you're in your you're in your fifties. It's the first time in your life you've ever been on your own. Do you know how lucky you are, yeah. man? You're a fucking big baby. And do you know what it is? To be fair to him, like, he's being upset and he's being miserable and all that, but. Because his ex lasted all his finances and basically did everything for him. Now he's paying bills. He's doing he's doing everything it's he should have, he could have done like the whole time. But he he convinced himself, oh, I can't do that. It's like a like, Bill Murray movie. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, <laughs> real, it you, is a little bit like a Bill Murray. If you movie, ever met it? my dad, you know he's way funnier than any Bill Murray movie. Really? My dad's so funny. I've seen Ghostbusters Not too. deliberately funny though. He's yeah. very. He's been talking about how he should go on the undateables because um, I love that internet dating team. isn't working out for him. I, I was so. walking down the street the other day. I just picked up a lamp from John Lewis. I felt a bit uncool, a bit old. <laughs> and then I was crossing the road, and this kid just went, "Lawrence." Oh my god! And, like that, I love and I was that. like, yeah, cool. I actually <laughs> "With the lamp in that. hand, just yeah, fist yeah, bumped. yeah." I, I, I smashed it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Do you know what? Though you are more likely to be role models than people on TV these days, and that is a massive that responsibility as well. With great power. It, but you know what though? It yeah. is. It's like you can, you know, you can reach people and soothe people and make people feel safe mm. all through the internet. That blows my mind because. I mean, I do these things online, like minute marvels for Instagram, where it's just like a minute to change your life, just a quick thing I've trying to get them, yeah. only dead brief, you know. Yeah. And I'll do longer ones, and then you'll get comments. And part of me is like, I feel a little bit narcissistic doing it, like, oh, who the fuck am I to like kind of do that? Mm. But then at the same time, you're like, if it if it just reaches somebody, and but I, they're putting that into you. You're not putting that into yourself. It's like uh, Jimmy Conrad, our mate, always says. Uh, Take what you do seriously, not who you are. Yes, like, and and and, and yeah, they are asking you. So if they're asking you, you then you owe them to at yeah, least try and help. That's them. That's a really good point. Yeah. yeah. Welcome to uh, the problem corner. I've already picked one out. I don't even know what to do. Oh, sorry. There's lo there's loads. So I'm a have... ten, but no boys want me. Yeah. So oh, this, this is this is Let's the first question. So this one comes from. We need a name. What name <laughs> would you like to give this? Person? Male or female? Female. Gemma. Gemma. Oh, that's a good one. Wow, Gemma's yeah. good one. Yeah. Mm. Her, so she's got sort of like, um, she's got a very American sort of posh girl name. So right. that's not too far off. I right. Uh, yeah, we're ready. All right. She's a 20 year old girl. Gemma from the Valleys. I, uh, hey guys, I know how vain I must sound, but here goes. I'm 20 years old and people think I'm really attractive. I'm pretty brunette. I have a small waist and I'm slim thick. That's why you like have a skinny she body, but good. like a. She sounds kind good. Of a, this, is, this can't be a real. Uh, we've, got, we've got our email, so. Don't get me wrong. I have lots. Uh, I have lots of insecurities, like everyone else. I just want to know from a guy's opinion. Sorry. Uh, why <laughs> why people don't think I'm good enough to date? Whenever I go out, I have lads following me around all night, trying to buy me drinks, and I get messages on social media from people I, uh, who just want to have sex. Mm -hmm. uh, Sorry about that. I've never been in a proper relationship <laughs> yet. All my friends uh, are in love, so I feel like the odd one out. Basically, I think what she's saying is uh, she dresses provocatively sometimes. Uh, is there any? Um, I re is there any? Picture? There's no pictures. No. Right. Yeah. Sadly for you, there's no. <laughs> no, but, no but. When someone feels undateable, but they feel so, it's clear that she doesn't have. No, so she's going in all the issues. wrong places. Right. I mean, that whole idea are that you, you typing a uh, name. In? I want to see if. Uh, she, right. She yeah, won. let's see. I, right. I think, yeah. from my perspective, there, you know, she's talking about clubs and 
guys who are drunk Ain't following her around, you're not going to find it. Like, yeah. also, this idea that love is just something that arrives because you're beautiful is ridiculous. And people think that because we've got this population now of immediacy. You've got Tinder, you've got all the dating websites, everything feels so present that mm-hmm. what happens is people think it should just happen. Finding love is quite miraculous when you actually do it and it happens and it's right it's Hang amazing yeah. yeah but she needs to look elsewhere she needs to kind of get brave why is she waiting for the guy to make a move why isn't she connecting with people on maybe social media that she's actually interested in and making that kind of expression and also just because yeah. guys want sex doesn't mean that you have to give it them so what don't. is she interested in as well maybe that's it find maybe passions meet someone who is into the same exactly. shit as you because that's right. usually a good such a good point a good starter um, and, also, and also there is there is the possibility that she might not be what she a thinks ten. she is she might be she might she be might like be a 7.5 narcissist. who thinks she's a 10 she might be a 4 do you know what I mean oh no a psychopathic narcissist wouldn't be asking you that they'd I, be demanding that it was I, happening good point most, mo- most most not all most girls who are a 10 have boyfriends unfortunately so really so maybe she's full oh. of shit do you, do you know I think it's the other way around I found it I, like that actually so you're a 10 but you don't have a boyfriend <laughs> do you know what I mean it's just anyway, never enough. Um, <laughs> just want to be very clear he doesn't have a boyfriend but if you are interested in Brian and you are a man slip into his DMs he more than happily <laughs> see you I have enough DMs off last sure just you want to feels, solicit it's sort of depressing it's when you're just looking through all of them you're like yeah <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah where's yeah. the no all this cock sort of. and you just can't <laughs> just, yeah just, um, no dick pics thank god yeah, yeah cheers <gasps> <laughs> so that's uh, now. Now oh, you're gonna another get girl? them. Oh no, that's that's another. Uh, she's on about the video. Logan too. Paul. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Slutty. Is that sl- wait? Did someone say slutty there? It says slutty. Uh, the slutty and the nice. Oh, that sounds good. Let's go for that. Okay. Basically, uh, basically, it, this, I love this one. Just get straight into it. There's don't no say, high. Don't say the age. Podcast. Though. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, name man. Name from man. Yeah. Jonathan. 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 Ooh. Good. Basically, I'm six foot three. And there is two girls from my school. Wow, six foot three. Yeah, school. but he's he's okay. old. Uh, for yeah, school ages. And one of them is known for being kind of slutty because uh, she moved around schools. Yeah, that's change often the schools. case. If you slut. change school, you're a slut. Dare that's you. notorious. Takes up the ass. So, yeah, clearly. <laughs> don't don't move school. Stay in one <laughs> school. You slut. Yeah. Um, and I know Dorty. some of my mates from the school, right? And I know some of my mates from the school she was at before, and she shagged two of his mates. Yeah. Silly. Uh, since she came here, I don't give her really any thought, apart from this long email you've just written, but <laughs> she got closer to me because she's best mates with my ex uh, that I'm still mates with, and she is now moving to, she's moving to me, and she's offered to show her tits bare, bare times. times. <laughs> And I never really wanted because I never thought she was anything. But now I like her a bit more. But I don't want to date her because I just get. No, 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 I, I, need, I need to just interject here. So what he's basically saying is there are also two other girls that he's flirting with. Right, but but he likes the slutty girl and he doesn't want to go with her because he thinks she's a slut. Go with the slutty girl, mate. Trust me on this. It's a really good idea. Um, Jonathan, you, Jonathan, Jonathan. There yes. are no such things as sluts. sluts. If a woman wants to have sex, no, really, then a woman should have sex. What? And, and if, the if idea, she wants to call a slut in the bedroom, that's fine. That's absolutely as as fine. I, so I've made a mistake before where I, I, uh, got, Silly. I Silly got a girl when I was like 16, 17, just started college, and she fancied me, and I, and, I, and, I, and I shagged her. Yeah. And then Big I mistake. told a couple of my mates, yeah. and then in college, they told their mates who told their mates, and by the end of the day, the whole college knew I'd been with her, and she felt like she was just mocked straight away. Spreading faster than the syphilis um, that you had. So... Shut the fuck up when you have sex with a girl, all right? That's really good advice. Everyone. That's actually really good advice. That's really good yeah. advice. It's the same though. Do you, not, do you not think as well, like he was just saying about, you uh, know, showing her boobs bare times or whatever, that I can't get over how many young people send videos and pictures of themselves, but then are really upset that mm. they show the mates, like everybody. It's just what young people do, isn't it? You get a picture of something, you show everybody, don't, so just don't, don't do, that, do it. No, so another thing, lads, is... Wait until you're it, in your mid-20s until you send no, it. No, if, if you are... Um, for a start, if you're getting attention, you don't want all the other girls knowing that you're getting attention. Like, keep everything to yourself. Yeah. Right. If you if you are getting a girl, be discreet. Keep, keep that to yourself because then other girls, if they know you've been with this girl, are going to be put off you for a start. It must be really tempting, though. I imagine when a girl says to you, "I really want to show you my boobs," that you're like, 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, lads. But I'm also, loved. yeah, girls. Especially if you're a, a teenage boy, he's still in the school. So yeah, still, but she'll you know. feel a lot of pressure to act in that way. Like, that's the right. way it works these days. You go on porn channels, you know what it's like. It's all about women wanting it, women being open to it. Well, you know, that's having kids, a real impact on how yeah, younger of people are, is. are having sex now because, like, when I was, like, girls were just like, like clueless when I first started. Like, yeah. apparently now when girls start having sex, they all they've watched porn and they are well into what's But do you so that happening. but there's a slight problem there that we seem to think that porn is a good way to have sex. I so, mean No, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Do you think I mean your what's your experience of porn? Um I, I just you know, I find I mean like I've talked about this before. Um I think that porn is just the same story told again and again which is that basically women are desperate for it they love it to be as aggressive and you know as really really rough or um, imposing as possible um, and it's bollocks you know women you see bollocks, you know? yeah I mean women might like it rough they might like lots of those things but this idea that the woman is this submissive character with yeah. the man being that as you said actually earlier on about hero that playing out the masculine I, I literally let me tell you every man I've ever met who's having sex with a woman is grateful right. they are not sitting there feeling like dominant some of them thank you during it many times do you know what I'm saying yeah. women women actually you know the big truth here is that women are very powerful in sex mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's oh, yeah. actually what matters and so <laughs> just to be clear, drives you didn't mad. say insect you said in sex it sounded like you said they're very powerful insects <laughs> but they are powerful and we are, we are you know but in so many ways we can produce life we, well, we can but also as far as sex make. goes like a woman a woman will dictate whether it happens or not yeah, yeah. I mean a, major it. a majority no let's be honest that Unless is how it Rules, there's something that? coercive yeah but yeah, yeah in, the, in good respectful relationships that's what happens so this bollocks online that women are all like these helpless creatures who just want to have like be deep throated it's not true and then you get <laughs> do you do you think do you what oh, she's just so real I love it do you think <laughs> that porn does perpetuate that or so for instance I had this conversation the other night uh, with my girlfriend over dinner we were saying we were would talking you about like the morality of, no no we were talking about the morality of porn because we'd obviously recently interviewed a porn mugger and we were talking yeah. about the morality of maybe not challenging that or like not you know talking with those sorts of people what as if you maybe should have pressurised them a bit more of whether or not that was a good career to I, have well somebody. no I was saying I was saying to her I felt not guilty but sort of like it doesn't validate what he does but some people had said to us like, I can't believe you had the porn mogul on like you know that, that I can't believe you call yourself there was a few comments uh, yeah. where people were like disgusted in us no, for allowing him on you can't well, that, that, that no that doesn't make sense because the only way that we can form opinions and I understand things is to listen and to open conversations. I think actually it's really important to have people like that. Do I think that um, porn is a great thing? No, yeah. because I don't think it's done in a way that really promotes great sex. Yeah. We have a sickness in our culture around sex. We have people living in relationships that are sexless because they don't know how to have great sex with each other. We have a real problem admitting what our fantasies are to one another. And there's a deep seated shame where porn is concerned often. So it's kind of seen it's as- like a Christian an, sort of- yeah. That's part of it. And the fact that it's like an individual experience, mostly used by men, mostly to masturbate on their own, not necessarily used in sex together. So to some degree, the fact that it kind of feels that exclusive relationship with the screen and you, and that it's kind of seen as a bit naughty or dirty, that kind of plays into so many myths. And really what we need to do is to be having great sex. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what we need to be doing. But this we're not. So, much. <laughs> so we're going elsewhere. You know, we're looking elsewhere. Like people will have a classic thing is guys tend to have a particular interest in a particular area oh, on like, let, let's right. be honest every man has a go to right it. exactly what's yours so um, yeah I wanna, I'm, I'm being quiet now because I do want to know um, big bums right yeah, particularly okay big so bums you've got that kind of thing <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you didn't have to grab it no but so in sex but, yeah. so like doggy position is something that for you is that what it is I mean, wow, you've nailed it you've nailed it but it's there isn't it's it it's like you're in his mind <laughs> yeah. and, and she's so, sort of reading me right now <laughs> but what else something that, a girl on top where you can hold it as good right as well. exactly but often guys won't say that 
Yeah. Oh, girls won't say it. I mean, I'm You're saying it. I'm putting it all out on the line. Really, this has been a very revealing week on the Church Audio YouTube <laughs> to channel. To some extent, it is good. To some though, extent. To some extent, it is good, though, that you can just say and, and feel say comfortable. It. Yeah. Yeah. And that it's say not. More. And that's I love big bums! There you go. <laughs> I'm <laughs> saying it. Finally. Well, my, my husband's, Hear me roar. My husband's yeah. last man all the time. Mm-hmm. That's his yeah. thing, yeah. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important is that we start having. So when we talk about therapy, full stop. <laughs> therapy is about. Only I could make this my choice. Therapy is about, like, honesty. Yeah. And when people are having sex together, they're revealed. You know, you're naked. You're as vulnerable as you're going to be. And yet, for some reason, you don't transfer that some to actually the Some people find that really hard, though, as well. There's some people still have a wall up during sex. So, like, when I've had sex with certain girls, it's like... For a wall? Like no, but they, they don't relax. Like no, they, but that's because they think they've got to perform. Oh yeah, right. And that's where porn comes in again. Yeah. Performance, and it isn't performance. But then sex, sex can be a little bit performative as well. Let me like tell you, if a woman yeah. is performing in sex, she will not have an orgasm. Yeah, no, but you, no, I, I mean that less. I mean like um, more of the side, like the performative <laughs> side look, of being sexual. <laughs> the look in your eye there, where you were like, let me and tell they you, should yeah, yeah. Uh, she's well, true. Well, no, not every time because it's quite hard for a woman to do that all the time and anybody who thinks that they're giving a woman an orgasm every time it's because she's faking it and it's right. as simple as that Sometimes oh my god isn't the time is right. it I've got, I've got to go to work right yeah. you know what I mean yeah. exactly exactly <laughs> that's actually very true and, and also you know you don't have to have that but what I'm saying is performance this stuff on screen it's like you have to act a certain way yeah. and yes role play is brilliant it's fantasy yeah. based and of course you should but what I'm saying is we're not getting to the stage where people are actually having those connected physical experiences because they're not telling the truth do you think there's an element of um because what was quite interesting was i watched a mind hunters hunters recently on netflix which is about how the cia started to map out yeah. serial killers yeah, it was yeah quite interesting. Profiling. yeah but most of them were sexually uh, as they called them sexual deviants i don't know if they still use that term yeah, yeah, they yeah, wanted yeah. to move away from yeah, deviants sure. what's a deviant um, well, someone, someone who deviates, deviates from normality yeah oh, from, right. the normal so stru- that, from the normal so idea. that could be loads of people then um, well, yeah, but you're talking sexual deviance would be more like when it's not legal. Oh, right. Where it's paraphilia, oh. where it's a particular predilection that we kind of is on the edge of. Oh, God, that brings back memories of, I think it might have been Britain's Taboos, where there was one guy who he killed a girl and then he... Had sex with the body. And then took pictures as well. Yeah, he posed her. Uh, yeah, 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 he did, in fact. That, the police that officer's really, daughter, that, that was terrible. That fucked me up, that, like, to be honest, right? Yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. Necrophilia. That, that poor police officer... Oh, I know he was oh. amazing. That family's amazing Honestly. as well. I know, I know. But that's the class. That's that is something that's a predilection mm-hmm. for certain people. It's very, very rare. Very, very rare. Fortunately. Do you think the kind of shaming of people who watch porn? I don't think you should shame anybody. I was going to say, but it sort of forces some people underground, or sort of. I don't think porn's bad, place. right? I don't right. think it's bad. I think the way it's given to us is right. telling a narrative that's yeah. untrue mm-hmm. I am not saying that I know what to do with that industry I don't know what to do with it I don't think that a man should feel embarrassed or a woman should feel embarrassed if you want to use it in sex together that's play that's fine I always talk about sex being adult play it's really really important that people enjoy it but I do think that there is a narrative within it which says a woman is supposed to enjoy whatever I give her thank you very much yeah. and it's about as far from the truth in great sex as it goes right. and like one of the areas I love working in is with sex therapy I, I love it because I know that it only takes telling the truth and sharing fantasies and actually engaging in trying out new things that make sense and just being open that's what makes fantastic sex but when you're young and this is the thing about young people yeah and I talk to my kids about it quite a lot because obviously they've got a 15 year old son at some point he's going to have sex it's as simple as that you have yeah, I yeah. hope he is going to have sex. What, what, whatever, whatever he no chooses pressure, to do. Whatever you want. Yeah. Exactly. He's wrote an email in here. That's yeah. right. That's right. That. Why does my, my mum want to know about my sex? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Bye, Tide. Yeah. Um, but he undoubtedly knows from my point of view that I know we'll watch porn at some time. I've said to him, you know, be selective, be discerning about the porn that you watch because it actually changes the way you think about bodies oh, and informs hell. it You're right, right. so Honestly. think about it ideally go for the softest stuff where it actually feels like there might be a consenting relationship there and also when you go on dates with girls like don't feel a pressure to have sex but also if you do and you want to make sure it's good make sure that you are pleasuring her and he, he, she is pleasuring you because don't waste your time but it's kids don't time. but you know what kids right genuinely the pressure they feel on and girls particularly to, to go ahead and do it and boy 
boys because they feel like they've got to get it out of the system because that's got to happen. Like, I want my boys to both remember their first time not as a hideous affair, yeah. and people have got time to think about that. But this kind of portrayal online is something that, to some degree, has the potential to damage. My main problem with porn that I don't think is good about it is when I first started watching, or when I, when I first started looking at it, I mean, about 12, 13, yeah. something like that, it took me a hell of a lot less, like maybe a picture of a girl yes, than I was there. that's right. Whereas uh, within like about looking through the Graton catalogue, people yeah. used to do it. Women in oh, yeah. knickers and bras—that was what people. So, used to sexy, yeah. so, yeah. so five five years later, and and then it has to be it's hardcore, basically half an hour. Yeah, and it exactly. has to be quite sort of aggressive. Yeah, and that's very classic. And yeah. that's also all right that people have aggressive sex. As yeah, well. of course yeah, it is. Yeah, of fine. course it is. But what he's saying that is important to know is for the, the, for the minds of the lads. Out there, yeah. It's a bit like drugs in a sense. You well, it, it's exactly like yeah. drugs because you've, you've got, got to go resistance. more. You've got to take more to get that high, and yeah. that's exactly the same. Exactly, way it works. that's exactly it. So yeah, I don't have an issue with it. I just think it could be done better. Um, I don't have an issue with anything liberated about sex because I think sex is great. And uh, what would you say to this guy who wants to doesn't want to see this girl's breasts, but uh, also has two other girls. I think he's basically he says, he saying... Doesn't, yeah. He doesn't want to get known for dating easy girls. So I think he yeah. just needs to stop caring what the fuck You're people right. think. You're right. And That's if he exactly likes her, it. give her a fucking chance because um, she, an open-minded woman's a very good thing Absolutely. To have. And also, you know what? The guys are having sex with her. The guys are just as culpable. So stop seeing it as a female oh, yeah. thing and see it as an actual liberated young woman who's tell you what, okay with if having I'm sex. Got, if I was to have sex with a girl and I was given a choice of a girl who'd had a hundred men or a zero, I'd go for the hundred. That's what Billy Connolly says. Have you ever seen Billy Connolly when he says about, he's talking about the, uh, not that I have any issue with um, with Islamic faith at all, I don't, um, but you know, the, the extremities, the mm-hmm. um, ISIS situation mm-hmm. and the being promised virgins and he said, that's not a heaven for me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I want a hundred whores. That's what I want. And uh, I, I think he's got philosophy. a great position. That's exactly the way. <laughs> well, we did say the way, best way to deal with ISIS is tell them that when they get to heaven, it's going to be full of Gay men. Yeah. yeah. That'll get them. Oh, oh. They weren't like that. <laughs> they weren't like that. Uh, well, I'm sure that. some of them would like some that. Them, yeah, that is actually <laughs> true. If, if you are in ISIS, there's a, like one Don't in 30 of you. Don't say that because some of them will be pressing buttons a lot sooner. <laughs> yeah. point. But although one in 30 of you will be gay, take a look around your uh, den. One of you is going to be gay. Absolutely. Statistically. Is my penis broken? I'm sorry, can we click the fuck oh, on that? Oh, let's see that one. What? This one comes from... I love the fact that guys are writing in and actually imagining that you are going to be able to explain that to I mean, them. Let me just think out. about my years of training as a consultant there with yeah. broken penises. Yeah. Do you have... I mean, you've <laughs> have you ever cock. broken? I, I mean, I... You've broken your cock. Have I? Have you? Nope. No. I've had a friend who did. Get this, I went and did, you know, years ago, P- P- like PGL holidays for kids, yeah? Like, they're like, away trips, Is this yeah? still recording on one of these cameras? Yeah, yeah. All right, well, PGL trip, yeah. I went, we'll just I, leave this in. I went, I went yeah. away, and um, it was for kids' holidays, and I went there, it was crazy. The staff there were insane. It was like, how they were allowed to look at our kids. I'm sure it's better now, but back in the day in France, it was like people were going to recover from something. So um, two things happened that were terrifying. One, this lad broke his penis, and it was everywhere, blood was everywhere, and he had to have medical attention straight away and then another if this was not oh as a girl just to throw in a girl story as well this girl I knew she was dancing on a chair and she fell and it was this handle was there and the back of the seat had broken and it went straight inside her in a, uh, in a hole it was terrible it was well, I know, terrible that, sexual I, I, injuries I, just said, I didn't know if it went in a hole or it just it went just straight in, in and it the, tore all the way up I mean it would do it wouldn't so it? can you imagine the, the statistical possibility of that happening I mean, is that some, what you said at the time that's I, amazing I, I because sometimes it. when you get on top of a woman it's, it takes a couple of seconds just to get yourself ready you know what I mean but right. that, could you that, imagine that was, are you going to tell this story from now on when someone's feeling a bit nervous you go well I mean, if a chair can go up, yeah. Do you want to know what else? Do you want to, do you want to, <laughs> That's pretty much what you should say. Do you want to know another story I know? Oh, yeah, let's go. This is really bad. So a lad that I know was playing football. with. He had his dog. He wasn't playing football with people. He was playing football with his dog. Anyway, put his jacket on the top of this uh, kind of football thing and was being stupid afterwards, climbed up on it to grab it, like climbed physically up on it, you know, yeah. jumped up. And as he did, he slipped. Mm-hmm. And one of the net hooks... Went bollocks. straight through his bollocks and ripped them. 
that actually happened. We need to be more careful out there. Mm. Can we? What happened to his dick? Yeah. So well, we are actually qualified to talk about yeah, this point with we've, all of our experience. We've all heard about broken dicks at some point. We have. Uh, the banjos, the, 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 the famous one, isn't oh, it? Oh, that That's must be. The, oh, even I haven't got one, and that makes you me feel What really sick. annoys me is when, when women get on top and they just don't take care. Do you know what I mean? Just be. Too hard. Well, Too yeah. rough. Or, or, or if you're that confident with your dick game, Stretching just make it back sure and you're. Forth. You know, on point. Right, quite literally. L- like, literally. What's up, guys? Love the podcast. So, earlier this year, I was with this girl and it got sexual. 100%. 100%. Uh, it was cool. The only problem was uh, when it was time to put the condom on, I struggled to put it on yeah. and I panicked and it went soft. That, that happens, mate. That's normal. It happened another time. So, she went on the pill and I hit it raw. Everything went fine. Everything went fine. Uh, we were not. We are not together anymore, and I will be involved with other women eventually. Here we go. Most ah. girls will make me wear a condom. This makes me very nervous. What do I do? Any advice? P.S. Mm. Do you think watching porn is part of the problem? Well, actually, that actually... That's actually a P.S. on that. No, that's a P.S. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's genuine. Yeah. Yeah. That, is, that is a problem, because people start... We know that. So um, when you're watching porn, you're utilising... Exactly. Right. But also, if he really wants to work on not going soft, when that happens he needs to practice putting one on whilst he's using porn if he's going to use it for a positive purpose Very good point. so just kind of but also I would take that away That's and I would I would try to get a little bit away from the porn and ideally just sit on the bed and masturbate using a condom with, because that will again that will stop that fear process what it's going to have is a fear process because it interferes with the moment and it's not unusual for men to lose a hard on at that stage so just to get his confidence back up in that way and also you know Ask the girl if you're in a situation. Ask her to put it on with her mouth. You know things like that that continue the stimulation. So, she, do you think a lot of girls would be able to put a condom on with their mouth yeah. like that? Really? Not ours. No, but the thing is, you've, you've got obviously you're going to have you're going to have the condom at the top. Yeah, with no, the, uh, I mean I get, and so I get the I get the logistics of that. I just think you why know, are you having sex with somebody that you can't ask to do something? This is this uh, is the whole it's the craziness. Isn't it? It, no, but yeah. the thing is that so, what, what you what you're not if you lectured him yeah. like this, I don't know how well he would do. <laughs> put this on with your mouth. I mean, no, no, but you know what I mean. You can say you but, can say to somebody, you know what I mean. Would you but, would you mind was, putting it on for me in a way that's like sexy? Because I find it's I, I think it's totally normal to say to a guy or to a girl to say to a guy or a guy to say to a girl. Condoms are a bit unsexy. They're, yeah. they're a bit unsexy. How can we just make them bit. a little bit more sexy? Yeah. Can you just like do it for me and like do it with your mouth um, or when I was sort of. 16, 15, uh, when I started. Um, when you were totally legal when you were 16. When I was 16, sorry. <laughs> and, and even when I was like sort of 17, 18, mm, the nerves ages. around a woman, I mean, it, it's almost like I would be raging and then I'd shut the bedroom door behind us and the nerves, and I, there was a few times where, uh, yeah. yeah, it didn't go according to plan. Like, But once, I, mean, I don't know what happened, but it was almost like, I just, once I stopped caring, that's it. that was it but it was that getting to that point where you, you have to let go of the worry of what she's going to think of exactly. you if it doesn't happen right yeah. there and then because one thing that men do when they go to sleep is they get hard they do so if you just say you know can we just wait until I'm ready yeah and most girls will be pretty understanding yeah. of that. Three o'clock in the morning, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world to, well, to do it, wake a woman up and be like, actually, are you ready? Exactly. So maybe... That's a really good point. Me. No, but maybe that's actually not the worst thing in the world because some lads just... Yeah, I think men have Com- so much pressure, and oh, particularly yeah. when they're younger, they have so much pressure. Because well, sex really relies on a man it in does. a massive way. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you are not yeah. loud and rock ready. I know, but that, and that, that comes down as well to foreplay though, doesn't it? You know, and feeling like you can ask for that and feeling like you can get what turns you on okay. and also about fantasy because again, you know, if you are experiencing that kind of level of fantasy that you're really into, you will just get hard. It's as simple as that. And it's yeah. the same with a woman, you know. Again, yeah. there seems to be quite a lot of shame about discussing sex full stop and yeah. talking about what you want. Mm. But when you do, you're essentially creating a equation for a great relationship physically. Uh, yeah, and also... Uh, it can be quite a bonding experience yeah. for some people as well. Well, like oxytocin, all yeah. of the kind of things that you release. Yeah. Absolutely. Try not to wank the day before as well. Have a full 24 hours of just no wanking beforehand really? because um, 
then you're sort of um, I love that fully, just prepare like, yourself if you have that issue because some men it's like um, right. they'll come too quickly they get hard but they come too quickly so they wank before but other men who can't stay hard it's because you've been wanking the night before so mm -hmm. find the balance that's, that's, what, head. that's head is what you're saying of, well yeah definitely and also um, like you say foreplay is always great because then she'll make you more relaxed if she's exactly and, and in return you. for her you know that's one of the things that guys don't understand that you know women really do need yeah, more time. stimulation mm -hmm. a lot of the time and actually by doing in that you'll have a miles better experience yeah, and he hasn't got a broken dick yeah it's Lucky. not broken it's just it's it's bit, just sensitive it's a bit shy, it's a bit yeah. shy. Yeah. Yeah. and yeah. also yeah i guess if it's you're losing nervous, the momentum yeah it's losing momentum sexual so momentum get her to be involved and like i said practice yeah. and if he's watching a lot of porn um try to get a what, little bit away from it no, what, what will be the issue is um like it's that extreme thing so yeah. like you've gone from watching a girl who's probably taken like three dicks at Ex once or yeah. whatever and yeah. then it's just yeah. a regular looking exactly. girl who isn't a porn exactly. star you can't take they've done surveys with young girls like under 15 16 year old girls yeah and they've actually Wait. said that they feel the pressure to have anal sex that's a big oh, pressure massively. wow now, when I was growing up, you know, anal sex was like something that you heard of in the mountains that was like, it never happens, they you know? You know what I mean? It never happens. It's the something good secret. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That village of strange yeah. anal people. Yeah. Um, nowadays, it's just like, no, it's, so it's, it's common 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 common. Like so with my first girlfriend, I remember she was like, like terrified of getting pregnant. Yeah. So she was like, just put up my ass. Yeah. And I was like, right, you sure? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It didn't fit. Yeah. But that was like, I was... That was what she, she was wasn't saying. pregnant because anal sex was just part of conversation yeah like, yeah it's changed so much but right. then again that puts pressure on lots of girls who don't want to do it you know mm -hmm. lots of gay men don't want to have anal, anal sex There's a large majority of gay men don't have anal sex because mm -hmm. right. it's not always pleasurable i mean it is if that's what you're into it's great if that's what you're into but you do have to kind of recognize particularly the younger generation that not everyone can do it. <laughs> don't think it's like you know the superheroes don't exist either. Just because you see it on screen doesn't make it actually real. That's why I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I bet there's a porno out there. Brings on your meaning to the age. You know just what? There will be. Catch it yeah. now. Yeah. You're absolutely right. There will be a porno out there. They do superhero pornos, weirdly enough. For sure they do. <laughs> Are we... Um is that an, enough do you questions? Want to do you want to do one more? It's the girl next door, it's called. All right. Uh, basically, I'm good friends with the neighbour next door, uh, as are my parents. So they came around the other night to celebrate Christmas. They yeah. brought the daughter, who they, I vaguely knew, but we got on and started talking. And later that night, when they all went outside, we were left in the lounge and things got a little heated. Oh, lovely. You could say, and she basically said, she likes me. Wow, we really got heated. Can I just say I like you? Things are, it's getting a little hot in here. <laughs> uh, however, however, I'm talking to someone at the minute... Oh, that talking to what is he's driving me mad. He's locked down. He's locked down because he's having a chat. That's speaking. I'm speaking to them. What does that even mean? But I want to carry things on with my neighbour. If she's a ten out of ten, oh, so I'm close. asking, what would you, yeah, asking what would you two do? And if we do start to crack on, how would we go about it? As it isn't something that's easy to hide away from our parents. Parents have working hours. <laughs> I mean. My first girlfriend lived around the corner, so I sort of was in Handy. this. Uh... I don't kind of get what his quandary is. Like, I know he's speaking because I've got this thing. My niece is fifth, like well, coming up to sixteen, and she's like speaking to a guy, and I was like, "What? What's speaking?" And she's like, "Well, that commitment, yeah, is that well, she's like, yeah, she's like, well, speaking is we're not actually officially going out with each other, but we're not speaking to other people." So I was like, well, "I just like I preferred the old days where you just like do you want to go out with my mate, and then you like go off with each other. That was the way it was, wasn't mm. it? And then you're like officially an item straight away for like three weeks. Yeah. But that one that he said there isn't the problem, is it? Because he fancies his neighbour. She's a ten out of ten. They get together she likes him and the only issue is and, the parents yeah. the parents will be chuffed because the parents will be like nice one we keep know an eye on, on them yeah. get on with you get on with you it's going to be great think about all the family celebrations we can have they already came on the over wedding. Christmas they yeah. already came over Christmas you're, you're close to a degree enjoy it but then be it respectful is. in front of her dad that's my that's right if you can, if you can win her dad over then you've, you've won so right. that's the thing be respectful yeah. and also don't rush it no just enjoy it, it. Yeah, exactly. but let the other girl down gently yeah, I don't God, stop her. Don't everything. ghost her. Don't ghost her. Don't ghost her. So don't ghost Don't ghost. Advice. Grow a pair. That's what I think really girls, annoys girls me. Girls ghost as well. Yeah, before. grow a pair. Have the conversation. Or, or even just sort of write some sort of message that is nice. <laughs> I don't like you anymore. I've met yeah. my neighbour. Merry Christmas. Just to fair. let you know. 
uh, you know, j- uh, just a Sorry, note. Sorry, you're a nine, she's a ten. Yeah, don't, <laughs> definitely don't tell her like that. Don't Maybe he's talking about the girl at the very beginning who thinks that she's a ten. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's it. Oh, we've we probably had crossover by now. <laughs> yeah, many, many crossovers. Yeah. People vengefully emailing. Um... <laughs> It's been a good one. Mate. It's Has been it? really interesting. To yeah. Thanks for having me. Thoughts. Thank you very much for coming on. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Um, we usually end it on on a question. Go. How would you like to be remembered? I'd like to be remembered as somebody who had a quirky sense of humour and didn't hurt too many people along the way and made really good cakes. Good. Perfect answer. What's your favourite cake to make? make? Oh my god, I like making carrot cake, carrot cake's good. cheesecake, chocolate Honestly. cake, all of them. They're not like Bake Off you cakes. You had me at hello. Right. They're like they, they taste <laughs> as as good as Bake Off cakes, but oh, they really? look pretty crap. But they're really tasty. It's all about yeah, the yeah. taste, isn't it? And That's your son, it. I think your sons must really love that as well. Oh, if your mum can bake, it's really good. Oh, all yeah. the mates think it's cool. They really don't care. Yeah, yeah. They just they they just a bit. Well, I'm just mum. Good point. Well, um, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Hope you've enjoyed it, you lot. And uh, (laughs) we'll put your links for everything that you're getting up to in the description. Thank you for sharing the time. It's been lovely. Cheers, everyone. See you later.